Pastor. We are hosting Pastors Howe and Leah out of the Heart of God Church, Singapore. Their very first time in Lagos, very first time in Nigeria, and very first time in Africa. We're so excited about this, and that's why it's an honor for me to welcome you into our space right here at the Covenant Place Igomu right beside the National Arts Theatre. I have in the studio with me some very special people, and then we'll explain why this is a special pastor's conference. How many times have I said special? <laughs> well, you're going to hear it a lot. You're going to hear it a lot of times, all right? So let me allow them to introduce themselves quickly. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. My name is Myron Job Glorious, and I pastor the Tribex, the youthful expression of the Covenant Nation in Gomo. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Sehila Amon. I'm a member of the TCN Igomu Camera and Bible Study Department. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I greet you according to your respective time zones. My name is Oluwani Primishi Omojolo, and I'm a member of the ushering department of the TCN Igomu Campus. That was a global greeting. Global greeting. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Dilmi, I'm a pastor of Covenant Connect, one of the youth expressions of the Covenant Nation. I'm In so happy to be here. Indeed, we are so happy to be here. And according to your respective time zones, we greet you <laughs> again. Thank you for, for telling us that, Fiche. Now, why is it special? I think I've said special like five times now. Now, let's explain it to you. This is a conference that is targeted at ministers, leaders, workers, and anybody that is young at heart and young in age, particularly, because we want to bridge that gap. If you know in Nigeria today, the median age is about 18 years. So if you bump to the left or to the right, you'll probably find someone in that youth board or youth bracket. And so we want to understand how to minister and how to connect, you know, with that generation, right? And that's why we're here. Pastors How and Leah have done that in Singapore, and it's such a beautiful thing that we've never, phenomenal, phenomenal that's the word, Pastor Muiwa, phenomenal. But let me tell you, Pastor D has been to yeah. Singapore in their church, and I just want to ask him to give us some insights into what he experienced there so that we know exactly what we are here for, for the next three days at this special conference. Pastor G. Well, I'm, I'm, <laughs> for one of my excitement is them coming physically, is that people would see, you know, and hear firsthand mm. what you're doing in Singapore. I don't think any other ministry in the world is doing what you're doing. Mm. And, and when I got there for the first few hours of the conference, I couldn't participate because of my <laughs> shock. <laughs> I was literally just looking like someone that <laughs> did. Because I was wondering that the young people didn't just participate. Like, mm -hmm. it wasn't about the activity. It was that they understood what they were doing. They had a generational mindset behind what they were doing. It was not just, oh, I'm here to... You know, when, when young people are doing things in this part of the world, just like recruit them so that they keep them busy, that mm -hmm. kind of mindset. Yeah, no, no, it was like they understand that they're building something. Wow. So, and I was sharing that one of the experience for me was when they called a 13-year-old girl to lead a prayer session. And uh, when she came up, my mind was, okay, it's like, okay, let's allow this lady lead. You know, I was expecting, God, I thank you for my mommy. Thank you for my daddy. You know, and all those prayer points. That's what I was expected. And the moment she opened up her mouth, it was literally groanings and travel, praying oh, for wow. nations. She was wow. calling Africa, Asia, generation. And she's 13. 13. 13. Wow. You need to hear like, the Like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, <laughs> 12, 13. Was that when I was 13? <laughs> <laughs> it takes the entire church yep. at least two seconds to to start praying in full capacity. Wow. Amazing. Like, the, the, the prayer goes like, wow. and I'm gingering. I said, can we begin to pray the whole church? Amazing. And I was just like, I looked and I had to tap myself that, it's a prayer session. You yes, need pray. <laughs> you need to pray as well. And I was so Indeed. sure. So I love the fact that yep. you understand mm -hmm. what you're doing. I don't just, they're involved, mm -hmm. yeah, but mm -hmm. they are also, they know that they are building mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that's the major thing that we're trying to catch here. Yeah. That we're not just seeing young people as winding away time, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, but they can actually be part of the system yeah. and even understand that we're working mm -hmm. and building something mm -hmm. spectacular. I agree, and I like that word you use, that it's something we're going to catch here because it's really an impartation and a revelation of how to really bridge this gap. Pastors How and Leah talk about their church being led by the youth, yeah. for the youth, to reach the youth. Yeah. So we want to understand that concept, and particularly the concept of generations that you said. But they are not the only ones ministering. Of course, our convener and host, Pastor Poju, you know, as you know, a DJ Pope, <laughs> pat patron saint of the youths in Nigeria, <laughs> and all over the world, will be ministering as well. Uh, but we also have Pastor Godman Akilabi yeah. out of uh, the Elevation, Elevation, Church. Elevation Church. All right. So, uh, Fiche and Tehila. Yes. Now, I want you to tell me particularly about, you know, your expectations for this, right? As in, you've, you know, probably seen a few things but because you're working in the department. So, mm -hmm. what are you expecting? What's your expectation here? Let's start with Fiche. Oh, okay. So, 
As for me, as I said earlier, I work in the ushering department and it's, it can be a handful sometimes because ushers get to the venue of the event first yeah. and we are also expected to make it convenient for everybody to come and serve God conveniently. I'm expecting that by the end of this program, I'll be able to, like he said, understand the, the essence of what I'm doing, not just participating in the activity, yeah. not just being religious, not just but having a mindset of understanding who God is and understanding that I'm not too young to do anything. Right. I'm not too young to raise the dead. Pastor, yes. Leah, Pastor How and Pastor Leah always talk about having a deep bench in ministry, mm -hmm. which means always having people to, younger people that can step in to the older generation yeah. when they're not available. Like watching their services, I've saw the table. There's a six-year-old girl in, in camera. When I was six, I don't think I even knew <laughs> to take a picture with a smartphone. Because at amazing. the end of this program, I want to be able to do more, to have, to have a wider view mm -hmm. of how I can affect my generation. Because yeah. I know that I carry something inside me that this generation needs. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. this generation needs. Yes, 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 <laughs> indeed. And that's why I need to tell you that if you're young at heart, young in age, and if there's any young person around you, just pull the person closer to you and say, stick to this channel. We are live on YouTube live on Pastor Podju's page as well. So just go on YouTube, search for Pastor Podju or The Covenant Nation, or just share the link you're watching with right now. Share it across Nigeria, across Africa, and all over the world, wherever you are. I want to turn to Tehila, but before I turn, uh, uh, Fiche, I caught something you said, that you're not too young to raise the dead. Yes. We say something at TCN Badagri, The Covenant Nation Badagri, shout out to my people there. We say you are not too young to worship, not too young to serve, not too young to praise. And perhaps we should start a hashtag around that. You are really not too young to do anything in the house of God. And that's where I want to turn it over uh, to Tehila to tell us how to praise. Tehila means highest praise. I hope you know that. All right, let's go. <laughs> So how and Leah were coming. I was curious, like, okay, was, what, are their, what did they do? What's their church about? And I was watching some of their videos, and I was like, ah, wow. wow. Because some of them, you, it touches aspects in life that you yourself, you didn't know were there. Like, yesterday, I was watching a video with my sister, and she was just like, Tehila, that's, do you understand what he's saying? Because he was talking about love and hate, and how they're not like, opposites, but they are together, they are just the two sides of the same coin. And most times, when you think about love and hate, they're like, oh, this one is good, this one is bad. But then, like, he said it in, his pers in a perspective that I was you like, could understand. I could understand I and, and relate to it. So watching it with my sister, both of us were like, wow, that we can't wait to see yeah. and hear what they have in store for us, mm -hmm. because they, can't, they really know how to captivate the youth. Right. God has given them that. Right. Oh. Indeed, and we can't wait to see and hear what they have for us. Yeah. But let me, let me invite you to a very special event in these three days. Now, we're here for three days, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Evening session, well, Lagos time, yo, mm -hmm. right? But 9 a.m. Every day, Nigerian time, that's GMT plus one. So do the math for your time. Yeah. <laughs> right? But on, uh, tomorrow, we have a special youth rally. Okay. Right? Yes. It's a very special youth rally. So if you're in Lagos, Nigeria, yeah. you should actually come into the center. We're going to be hosting the anointed minstrel, great man, Tackett. You just heard yeah. Pastor yeah. D talk about <laughs> it. They are like buddies, you know? Yes. So, so great man, Tackett is going to be live in the building. And we're going to have a wonderful youth rally with Pastor How, Pastor Leah, Pastor Podju, Pastor Godman, and great man, Tackett. Yeah. So tell us, Pastor Muiwa, what should we expect in these three days, particularly around that great man, Tackett? <laughs> Um, for me, I remember the, the, the first uh, you rally, like you rally that we have at Covenant Nation. I was blown away, yes, right? I started I dancing that. after a while. The energy was gone because, yeah. I mean, I couldn't match up. So that amount of energy of people praising God, all right, people worshiping God, even though we'll be dancing, we'll be yuppie, but there's something that we are doing. We are glorifying the name of God. So I can't wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for the youth rally. And I know it's going to be an amazing time. And for the conference, um, you know, I, I, I'll say there are six things that I want us to know. So three for the young generation, three for the older generation. The older generation have knowledge, wisdom, and experience. So we young generation, we are not coming to take over. It's not a takeover spirit. Mm. Mm. That's, not, that's not the spirit of yeah. God, right? Yeah. And then for the young people, we have creativity, innovation, and strength. 
So how can we leverage those six things for the next move of God? That's Amazing. what I want to see Amazing. at this conference. And yeah. um, every young person out there, you need to make it. If you're in Lagos, you need to make your way down to the covenant nation. That's my expectation. Indeed. And as the Bible says, these are the generations of them that seek you, O yeah. Jacob. So it's very important to seek God at such an early age. And we are bringing this expression of ministry just to understand really how to do that. As you can hear, six-year-olds, 13-year-olds, nine-year-olds, you know, 18-year-olds are doing things that, you know, yeah. What, what, yeah, what was I doing? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to actually remember what I was doing like at age 13. Yeah. Well, it's, um, that's powerful. Meeting and no, that, that's powerful. It's, it's, that's powerful. It's, it's, and these things are not just for, you know, what you call ministry. It's actually for life, yeah. insights for living. So this is something you can practice in your school, you know, yeah. in, in boarding school, just leadership impartation, leadership skills, things that will connect you, right, uh, to life skills that you can use forever. So I'm inviting you specially. We are yeah. inviting, inviting you, you specially, specially yeah. right, right here at the Covenant Place, Igomo, beside the National Arts Theater. If you are in Lagos, you should be here. This is where to be. You have three pu pu public holidays in Lagos. You have no excuse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, now have, you have three days of public holiday. Oh, no my. excuse at oh, all. My. Right? But if you are anywhere else in the world, then you should stay tuned and stay fixed to the Covenant Nation YouTube channel or Pastor Koju's YouTube channel. And please share that link with as many people as are out there that you believe will resonate with this special pastor's conference yeah. with pastors How and uh, Leah yeah. out of the Heart of God Church, Singapore. Special shout out to Singapore again. Thank you for sending them over. Yeah. We will <laughs> send them back after three days. Yeah. <laughs> after three I'll, days. I'll make them more. Sorry. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I was speaking to my wife this morning. I said, when you're listening, yeah. that's what we want in advance. And you might first feel like, have I been doing in life? In life yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, but don't feel like that. Right. They will also tell you that it's been a 20 year journey. Yeah. Then. Indeed. Because when you got there, if I saw one of the persons that we went there, she was, she was beside me and she was just crying. Hmm. She's not been doing anything. I said, no, I'm actually not doing anything. It's just like it takes time for these yeah. things to do. Yeah. So you watch yeah. this thing. Just don't feel discouraged. Okay. Sometimes you look at the distance. I'm like, where do I start from? Mm. How do I even start to do this? Yeah. It's like you missed. But there's always so much to start. And there's always a little action you can take. Yeah. Thank so you, Pastor D. That's, so so that's so very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. For the parents in the house yes. that have young children or teenagers, yeah. I would advise you, please bring your children to watch it. Yeah. Bring advice, them. Advice, you feel like, advice. Even if you feel like they wouldn't <laughs> understand anything, it might be a sentence or two that will stick out mm. to them and that will take them to what they need to accomplish in life. Please bring your children, bring your teenagers. If you can't make it, get your dancing shoes, your notepad, your pen, your water, something to snack on, and please stay tuned, stay in front of your camera. It will be a time. You I told you, you see, they're coming out now. <laughs> they're coming out now, I warned you, I warned you. All right, Ayla, what are you telling us? Which advice are you giving us now? Um, have an open mind, yeah. listen. You never know what you might hear that might impact your life. Yeah. That's what I have to say. Okay. Pastor Mui, I want you to talk about, you know, this, this praise thing, because you, you hit it at the beginning. You said the first praise experience we had when we had the first youth rally, yeah. that it was so wow to you and all of that. Mm -hmm. But what is that importance of praise? Why must it be, you know, because everybody's like, you know, let's just sit down and listen to the word of God. Mm -hmm. But what's this praise angle? And you know that energy is there. Mm -hmm. so, so how does it connect to our worship of God, if you like? Yeah, you know, when Jesus was teaching about how to pray, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing was hallowed be your name. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. always glorifying God. So... I personally see praise as prayer, you know, worship as prayer to God, where you are fully dependent on him, mm -hmm. and then you know that he's your only source. Mm -hmm. Men can be channels, men mm -hmm. can be vessels, but he's your only source. So it's not just it's about the dancing and yeah. the jumping. You're excited in your spirit with joy because yes. you know that I've got a God who is faithful and who is good all the time. Indeed, so, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Excited, the spirit of joy. That's a very, very important thing. We're going into the main ministration now, going into the opening session of this special pastors conference out of the international conference of pastors, ministers, leaders, and workers. So like Fisher said, get your dancing shoes, get your snacks ready, right? <laughs> and put away, put away distractions. If you've heard that before, then you know what I'm talking about. So put away all distractions. Make sure your internet connection is top notch, yes. right? So that you don't miss any part of this special pastor's conference. Pastor Howe, Pastor Leah, Pastor Godman Akilabi, and our very own DJ Pope, Pope yeah. Pastor yeah. Koju Oyemade, will be ministering. I want to invite Fiche. I didn't tell her before this, right? So we're closing now, but I want to invite Fiche to pray for you, right, as we start this ministration right now. Fiche, over to you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. Amen. We thank you for allowing us to be able to stay in your presence. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the adoration. Amen. Oh Lord, we ask that you 
give us a word that will stand out to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray for everybody behind this screen, for everybody here in person, for everybody on their way, that this event will be one that will stand out to them in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. I, I speak that as they hear the things they hear this season, to take them to the next level of their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. To enable them to carry out their divine assignments in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I ask that you give everybody an open mind so that they don't contradict what you're already telling them in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I ask for every pastor, for every minister, I speak growth to their to their congregation in Amen. Jesus' name. I speak understanding to their congregation Amen. in Jesus' name. I pray that you bless them with seeing eyes, understanding hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we step into this prayer, to this conference today. At the end of it, we shall have all cause to glorify your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you. Over to the main auditorium where we will go into prayer, ministration of the word, of course, a very intense time of worship and praise as well. My name is Soji Akele again. It's such an honor to be with you and my Thank friends you. here, Thank welcoming you. you to this special pastor's conference with pastors How, Leah, Pastor Podju, and Pastor Godman Akilabi. God bless you. See you later in the day. Yo 
every step of the way that every utterance that will come from this pulpit 
shall originate in your spirit and people will be blessed generations will be transformed Jesus will be glorified in Jesus mighty name Amen all right, we all be seated. Amen. Are you excited this morning? All right. Um, I'm sure you all know we have Pastor Ham and Pastor Leah in the house. And they are here with their team. All right, so minister to us. I think, if I, if I remember correctly now, if I'm accurate, it was two, I think it was 2017, and that's how I got to know about their ministry. Uh, 2017, I was just looking through my Instagram, and I follow Pastor John Bever. And so I saw him, and he went to minister, and it wasn't just, I mean, ministers in many places, but... He spoke at length about a church in Singapore where he ministered and the things that he saw in the place. So I went to the page, all right, of the church, and when I looked through, I said, something different is happening here. So I decided to go for their conference, which you have to apply to enter. And uh, uh, <laughs> it's a story where we say, they didn't take me because they said I was overqualified. That is for young ministers and none of that. Me, I knew what I was looking for. So I told them that, okay, even if I'm not overqualified for the conference, I'm not overqualified to attend church service. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to go there. And um, during the time, well, then, I mean, things later on, that after everybody, they said, oh, you, all of you, you, you and your people can come and all of that. But I knew there was something very significant that was going on in that ministry. And I'm saying this, I hadn't seen anywhere in the world. All right? I hadn't seen it anywhere in the entire world. And when I got to the church in Singapore, what I saw was different from what I even saw on Instagram. I entered into the place and it, it, it is transforming. All right? It's the, you, I mean, the service itself is transforming. Can you play the video? I put a video out of Heart of God Church. Can you play it if I go on introduction? Can you connect with the sound, please? Stop the video and connect with the sound, please. All right, we're going to
Imagine walking to that kind of atmosphere. All right. I saw 12 year olds handling cameras, sophisticated equipment, 13 year, nine year olds. I said, if this one leaks into Nigerian churches, we better reorganize ourselves before they do. <laughs> All right, let me just leave that. But I, I saw it there. And let me say this here. This is the most significant thing. You saw the images, you saw the sound, you saw that, but the power of that church is in the ability to raise leaders. It's not in the light. It's not in the runway. Uh, you follow what I'm saying here? Ability to raise leaders, to build strong communities. After COVID, when I saw the service after COVID, that everybody came back 5,000, I said, that's the power of Koinonia. <laughs> Community, interaction, discipleship. You understand what I'm saying here? That, that flash you see there is just the celebration. But the church itself is that. So I told myself that, look, I have to bring um, this people to Nigeria. And so I started thinking about it. I communicated with them. And um, finally, when the time was right, they graciously accepted, all right, to come. And to be honest with you, I will say this because many ministers are listening. I think it's time for the church in Africa to look within and to look east. That means that to look to Asia. There are a lot of things in that place that align with our culture, align with our values, all right? And they have held on to certain tenets of the faith that I believe that an alliance between Africa and Asia is the future of the Church of Jesus in the world today. I, I know what I'm saying, all right? I'm, they yeah, are very, very, very hum I mean, I do just want to say some things. Um, I mean, I mean, you, I mean, I mean, you, you, no, no, let me say it so you understand. You put them in a hotel room, they say, don't you think this is too expensive? You get what I'm saying here? It's not, uh, you have to honor us. You can see that, that, that real desire to win souls is there. You can't say heirs of big manism and all of that, and you know the capacity. So I think this is going to be not just, I mean, I've had calls from Kenya. I've had people from Ghana. Where are you? Some folks are from Ghana here. Huh? Where are you? Okay, that's, ah, from, okay. I've had calls. I don't know whether the Kenyans have arrived and all of that. But I believe that, you know, this is going to uh, start something, not just in Nigeria, but on the continent. All right. So our first speaker this morning will be this. Well, they have five senior pastors, but senior pastor of the Heart of God Church, all the way from Singapore, <laughs> Pastor Ha. Hello, everybody. Will you give Jesus a bigger, bigger, the biggest applause? He deserves all the glory. And unless the Lord builds the house, we, leaders and ministers, we labor in vain. So all glory to Jesus. Amen. And then before you sit down, put a big smile on your faces. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are very good looking this morning. And tell them, I'm in church, I do not lie. <laughs> Amen. Please be seated and uh, wow, this is my first time in person here in Nigeria or, or anywhere in Africa. 
first time in this continent. And wow, when you experience worship, your worship of Africans, of, of Nigeria, it is a whole new level. The way you worship is like praise and worship on steroids. I can, I can never be the same again. I turn to my wife and pastor together. I say, we need an African or Nigerian worship team in our church. And then I thought about it. No, it's actually not the stage. It is the people, the crowd. Your worship is amazing. Wow. When I'm in heaven, and, and I do not how, know how heaven will be like, but when I'm in heaven, I'm going to worship with you guys. <laughs> uh, I am not going to hang out with the Chinese section. <laughs> I'm going to hang out with you because your worship, you, your worship can resurrect the dead. It is amazing. So I want to thank Pastor Poju, Pastor Towin. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invite. Sincerely, thank you for the access. Your influence has opened up the door for generations to come to this nation, to come to this continent. And I do not take it for granted. Thank you very much. Please give your pastors, or Pastor Poju, Pastor a big hand clap. Come on. Yes. He, he's a very humble man. He's feeling very, very awkward right now. I know, I know. I, as you remain standing, I want to say one thing. There are three kinds of sights that a man, a great man, that a leader needs to have. First is foresight, vision. Hindsight, and that is learning from experiences. And then most importantly, insights. And what you have here in Pastor Pochu is, yes, dreams and vision. Yes, experiences. But most important, this man I know have insights. And insights is so valuable for the church, for the ministry, for the continent, for the nation. Because in the age of internet, information is no longer valuable. You can access information from the internet, but what is precious is insights. And this man has it. Please give him a big hand clap. Thank you. All right, you may be seated. Okay, are you ready to get started? All over the world, as I have traveled, as I have observed, is that churches are losing young people. Churches are dying. In our book that my wife and I co-wrote, Generations, I wrote a chapter called this, Christianity is one generation away from extinction. Just one generation, and sadly, it is global. In Europe, in Australia, in Asia, I believe maybe in Africa, all over the world, the church is graying, the church is dying. I am sure you have heard of the great Korean, South Korean revival. Let me give you some statistics over here. We all know the largest church in the world back in the day is in Korea. Churches of 800,000. Churches of 100,000 is almost like normal. But even in the great Korean revival, the revival will come to an end. Christianity will cease just quickly in one generation. So listen to this. Before the Korean War, the statistics is 4% of South Koreans were Christians. 4%. By 1985, Korea experienced a revival. And it went from that 4% to 34%. That's revival. One third of the nation became Christians. By 2015, it has dropped to 22%. Now, 22% is not bad. It is still one in four. But what's worse is that within that 22%, as they do a survey demographically, 
Now, this is a government survey. Demographically, they have found that for young people, only 3% consider themselves Christian. Only 3%. And if you look at it, that 3% is worse than the 4% that they started with. So they have gone, unfortunately, a full cycle back to where it started. Revival can die off. Christianity will be extinct in a nation in one generation if we are complacent about it. And I believe here in Africa, you have experienced great revivals. We hear it in Asia. You know, as Pastor Poju say, look is. But for us, we hear about your stories. Some of the largest church comes from you. Some of the largest buildings, massive building that we cannot even imagine that sits 100,000 bigger than football stadiums, they are from you guys. But if we are complacent, all these will die off in 20 years 50 years. We do not want to be like the South Korean Christians. We need to act now in the midst of the revival you are already having that we need to focus on the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. Amen? So, I believe we need to add another kind of measurement to the way we define success. So pastors and leaders here, the way we define success all over the world is how big is your church? Right? But we need to add not just how big, but how strong and how young. We need to add this statistic to our measurement and help us redefine what success is like. So like for our church, we always measure the average age of our church. So I am very proud to say that our church, after 25 years as a ministry, our average age is 23 years old. And and let me tell you, it is difficult. It is like running down an upward escalator. Every year, the people get older. And so, if we don't do anything about it, it will be 24 and 25, and soon it will be 35 and 45. I want to challenge you, no matter how big or small your ministry is, go back and estimate and measure how, what is the average age of your church. And you will get an idea. And, and listen, find out what is the average age of your country, Nigeria. And then find out the average age of your church. If your church is older than your nation, it means that your church one day will cease to exist within your nation. Find out the average age of your church and compare it to your own age. If your church is older than the senior pastor, it means that you will live to see the death of your own church. That is something all of us founding pastors and senior pastors do not want to see, to see our lives work ceasing. So we got to have the average age of our church younger than the senior minister, younger than the senior team, so that we know that when we hand over the church, It will be a young church for the next generation. Do I hear an amen for that? So that's the challenge. Find out the average age of your church. Amen? So if you want a transgenerational church, you must focus on the young generation. It doesn't happen naturally. Do not think that just because your church members biologically, they give birth and they have children, that these kids will grow up and stay in church. Do not assume that they will automatically be serious for God. It, just because they are in church does not mean they are serious and on fire for Jesus. We need to focus on the young people. 
So, number one, if you leave this conference, you need to have a few mind sh- mind, uh, mindset shifts. And so number one is use uh, leaders today. You know, we often hear people say, oh, we love young people. They are the future. They are the future of our church, the future of our nation. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, everybody knows that. But today, I'm telling you the mindset shift is use our leaders today, right now. Let the 14-year-old in your church lead. Let the 9-year-old in your church serve. So I'm going to tell you just about this boy. And this one boy is a microcosm of the thousands of young people in our church. So this boy is called Ethan. And uh, he came to church when he was 9 years old. Now, if you look at him, he's cute, he's smiling. But behind that smile... It's a very reluctant boy. He doesn't like coming to church. So he would oversleep so that he will not come to church. He will pretend to be sick so that he doesn't have to come to church. But on one of those days as he came, our children's church teacher noticed that he enjoys, he has an interest in photography. So they hand him a camera and say, from now on, you are the photographer for our children's church service. And by that one act alone, you guess what? He comes to church three hours before the service starts <laughs> to prepare, to pray. He is so involved in church, he never missed church anymore. We involve him. So as he was capturing photos in church, he was being captivated by Christ and by the church ministry. So listen, as he, Ethan, grows in skills and in character, at 15 years old, he became the youngest leader in the ministry, in the photographer ministry. At 19 years old, and at 19, he had 10 years of experience already. Now, he is training other young people in his ministry. And today, he is also leading a connect group Use our leaders today. Don't wait for them to be older. The mistake we always make is, oh, you are nine nine years old. You know what? When you are older, when you are 19, then we let you serve. No, that's too late. You got to let them serve right now today as they are nine years old. Amen? Because young people, when when they come to church, they need to be involved. Listen, if you don't captivate youth for Christ now, the world will take them captive with another vision. That's the basic philosophy from my wife, Pastor Leah. She looked at all the young people, 7, 9, 15 years old, and said, if we don't captivate them right now, in a few years, we're going to lose them. YouTube will get them. TikTok will get them. They will grow up with another vision in their hearts. We need to captivate them today. Amen? So how do you do that? Again, listen. It is very simple. It doesn't take a special anointing. Some people look at Pastor Lee and I and they say, Oh, it's because Pastor Harper said have a special anointing for young people. The Lord has chosen them to be the speaker and the voice for young people. Nonsense! (laughs) We don't have a special anointing. Everybody, every pastor, every leader can do it. It is a rocket, it's not rocket science. How do you do it? Here's here's what you do. You young people, they need to be invited, included, and involved in ministry. That's all. I'm going to let that settle down. Some of you are saying, that's so simple. Yes. That's why it's global. Every culture, every ethnic group can do it. Young people need to be invited, included, and involved in ministry. That is all. That is why for Heart of God Church, we have young people serving all the time. 80% serving in ministry. 75% plugged into a connect group. 
you will see teenagers serving. You will see young people operating expensive sound equipment, as Pastor Poju has said. So all these is so that they can be involved and included into the ministry. And with that, we have found that kids can actually build a world-class church. It is possible. All you have to do is, say with me, invite them, include them, involve them. Everyone can do it. Whether you are a church of 50, 5,000 or more, every person, every church can do this. So listen, we invite, include, and involve them. Only after that, then we can influence them and impact them. See, we want to influence and impact young people. But that is only after they are included and involved. So that is when discipleship happens. See, discipleship happens when they are serving, when they are involved. You can, it's very difficult to disciple them if they are just sitting at the pews. You, you got to understand, young people, like, it's like sports. I know Pastor Pujo likes football, Liverpool. See, and, and in England, they involve them in the sports when they are four years old when they're seven, when they're nine years old, and only when they're involved, then you can train them. Then you can say, you need to improve yourself. You need to have discipline. You need to go running. Without being involved, you cannot tell a kid to get up and run five kilometers. But when you involve them in a football team, they will run. They will practice. They will turn up for trainings. And it's the same philosophy. Young people need to be involved before we can disciple them. Amen? So discipleship happens when they are involved in the ministry. So when people are talking about discipleship, listen, I want to be clear to you. Discipleship is not just Bible study. Discipleship of young people is not them attending service. Think about Jesus. Jesus. Yes, Jesus preached to the crowd, but his disciples were different. His disciples walked with him, journeyed with him. What he taught his disciples was different from what he taught the crowd. When Jesus discipled them after a miracle or before a miracle, he will disciple them, he will teach them. So, what I'm doing here right now, I am teaching but I'm not discipling you. This is not discipleship. Bible study classes is not discipleship. Is it good? Yes. Should you have them? Yes. But do not mistake that for discipleship. Discipleship is bringing them along in your life. Discipleship is involving them in ministry. And as they are serving and doing the ministry, you are standing beside them and then you are discipling. That is discipleship. Amen? And, and that is why involving them, including them, is so important. Dr. A.R. Bernard says this, maturity does not come with age, but maturity comes with the acceptance of responsibility. Maturity comes with the acceptance of responsibility. So when you have a 14-year-old and then a 40, 50-year-old, the 40, 50-year-old man, he is not responsible. He is gambling. He is in debt. He is not feeding his family. He is womanizing. And then you have a 14-year-old boy and maybe he, his father has left the family. He rose up. He took responsibility for the family. He saved money. Maybe he even went out to work, a side hustle. He takes responsibility for his younger siblings. Tell me, the 40, 50-year-old man is more mature or the 14-year-old is more mature? How many of you say the boy? 
the boy. The boy is more mature because he has accepted responsibility. Maturity does not come with age. So that's why when you look at young people, don't make the mistake of seeing them young in age and think that they are immature. Don't look at a 40, 50-year-old man and think that he is automatically mature. No, 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 no. Look at the way they accept responsibility. And so that is why when you involve and include the young people and you put them into ministry and you teach them, you disciple them, and then you observe and you will know among them there will be some who rise up and take responsibilities. And those will be the leaders, the young leaders of your church and of your ministry. Amen? Amen. So, young people, you will be surprised when you give them an opportunity, when you believe in them, they will rise up in maturity. They will rise up and take responsibility for your church. Listen, maturity is the acceptance of responsibility. Look for responsible young people. Jesus took responsibility for our sins. Even though he was innocent, he took responsibility. Find young men and young women like Jesus who will take responsible, responsibility for the ministry of the church. Amen? So what I've talked about is phase one. Invite, involve, include them. But then when you do that and you notice that they are disciple and maturity, then you can go into phase two. Now, phase two, I'm going to invite Senior Pastor Garrett to come up here and share. Now, I want to introduce him. Past senior Pastor Garrett obviously is the newly installed Senior Pastor of our church. He is also the CEO. And uh, so he's, one of his responsibility is to negotiate and acquire land and property for our church. So, so he's a brilliant young man, and actually he's not young. Very soon, in a few months, he's going to be 40 years old, but he looks like he's 20 years old. So, so I guess this is the blessing of growing a youth church. You also look young at the same time. So come on, Pastor Garrett. So Pastor Hal talked about phase one, where you need to invite, include, and involve the young people. So today, phase two is that after that, you need to give them a voice and a vote. You need to give your young people a voice and a vote. Do you let your young people speak up in your church to give ideas, to give suggestions, to make changes in your church? And more than that, you need to give them a vote. Don't shoot down their ideas, but support their ideas. In fact, resource their ideas. Give them budget for their ideas. And what else? You need to give them a seat at the table. So not just invite them to a party. You know, a lot of churches, we do this. We have a youth camp, a youth event, a a youth service, and we let them have their own party. But that is good. But don't just do that. We need to invite them to sit at the table to make decisions for the main church, for the things in the church. So you need to give them a voice and a vote, and you need to give them a seat at the table. You know, one thing that we share a lot in the Heart of God Church is that we are a church by youth, for youth, to reach youths. So if you want to have young people in your church, you need to let the young people do church. Amen? You know, because the young people, they know what the young people like. And even for myself, I begin to realize that I need to listen to the young people because I do not really know what the young people like. You know, for example, in, when it comes to fashion, you know, older generation millennials like me, we think that skinny jeans are cool. But how do you know that nowadays the Gen Z, the Gen Alphas, they like baggy cargo pants. So that's why I've thrown away all my skinny jeans. 
You know, they are so different. Even when it comes to visuals, when you talk about sermon visuals, the older generation, they have a different taste from the younger generation. When it comes to invites for church events, the older generation and the younger generation, very different. And that's why we let the younger generation, you know, they run our online church because they are the face of our online church because they know what the young people like. Amen. And also, when it comes to Hollywood heroes, I I know in Nigeria, you guys have Nollywood. uh, But when it comes to movies and media, you know, it used to be in the older generation, we like heroes that are cool and suave, like Tom Cruise. They are perfect, almost invincible. But the younger generation, they, they like heroes. You know, when you watch Netflix, they are popular with Gen Zs. They like heroes that are fumbling, that are imperfect, that are making mistakes because they feel that they are relatable. It's more organic. It's more realistic. It is so different. So if you want to reach young people, you need to have a church by you, for you, to reach youths. It's not just a slogan, but it's literally letting the youths make decisions. You know, another thing that I've learned about this younger generation is this. You know, for the older generations and even millennials like me, you know, we grew up in a generation where there is radio broadcasts and TV broadcasts, if you know what I mean. And and so, basically, when you turn on the radio, you can only listen to the songs that the radio plays. When you turn on the TV, you only watch the programs that is broadcasted. But the younger generation, they are living in a Spotify and Netflix generation. They choose whatever flows with their vibes, whatever music that they like. They have a diversity of taste and preference. Even when you talk about TikTok, there is a For You page. It is customized to their likings, to what resonates with them. So our young people tell us this, all right, that pastor... You know, if we want to reach young people, it's more than just about a demographic. Because we have friends of the same age, but they all have different vibes. They all like different music. They all have different tastes. They all have different preference. So they say, you know what? If we want to reach young people, we need to have services in our church that appeals to the different vibes. Not just the different ages, but the different vibes. So in Heart of God Church, when the young people say something, we say, yes, boss. We will do that. So we let them run and plan our services. And so we we begin to let them form three different teams of young people that represents the three different vibes. And they went on to plan our services for Christmas and for Easter. And when they plan out the services, they literally plan every aspect of the service, from the songs to the testimonies. They even, we, we even consult the young people and says, okay, so what kind of sermon should I preach for this kind of vibe? And they'll say, pastor, you should preach this, you should share about this, this is the problem. And we say, yes, boss, we will preach that sermon. And, and so we listen to the young people. We support their ideas. You know, they come to us with the ideas and we just ask one question. How much? And we support, we give them the budget that they need. So with that, you know what, I want to give you an idea of what they came up with with the three different vibes of services. So I just want to show you, this is the first vibe of service that they had. It is fun. It was laughing. Everyone was laughing. It was goofy. That's what they like. And then we have a second vibe of service that they came up with. And it looks something like this. It's more like a club than a church. It's cool, it's PG, it's creative. Then it came out with a third type of vibe. Then it looks like that. It is homely, it is warm, it is relational. And so that's how we went on three services in service. And the youth were right because we saw thousands of young people coming to church that weekend and many of them giving their hearts to Jesus. We reached the young people. Amen. So we've got to build a church by youth, for youth, to reach youth. Amen. So one thing, of course, the doctrines, the values, the theology that we teach in church never changes. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The message never changes. 
But we need to let the young people change in the presentation, in the vibes, in the methods, and how this message is presented. So I want to challenge all the pastors and leaders here today. You know, do you have young 14, 15, 16-year-olds in your church doing your planning? Do they have a voice? Do they have a vote? Do they have a seat at the table? You know, one thing that you could do, just to try an idea, is will you do an anonymous survey with the young people in your church? Anonymous so that they won't know, they can say the truth. And, uh, and t- ask them to tell you what do they like and what do they not like about church? What do, you, what do they think that when, if their friends will come to church, they will not like about church? And I want to tell you, pastors, it's going to be painful to hear what they have to tell you. But it's going to be good because it's going to help us be more relevant to the young people. The other thing that we need to do is we need to know that youths should, not be, on the, should be on the front lines and not on the sidelines. It means that we got to let them lead in the styles, in, in the methods, we, and we need to be encouraging and nurturing and loving and patient to all of them. You know, one thing in our church is that when we work with young people, the default is to say yes to them. Whatever ideas they come up with, whatever creativity they come up with, we say yes to them. That is our default. Because a lot of older people, we like to say no to young people. You know, we put down their ideas, we put down their suggestions. But hey, we've got to learn to say yes to the young people. The only time when we say no is when it's immoral, illegal, sinful, and and of course, we will say no to that. So we need to give the young people a voice, a vote, a seat at the table. You know, I grew up in Heart of God Church. I came as a 12, 13 year old, uh, close to 30 years ago. And my senior pastor, Pastor Hang and Pastor Lea, they did that with me. The first thing they did was they invited, they included, and they involved me in church. So as a young teenager, I will be serving on the worship ministry. I'll be serving in the services, helping run uh, the programs in the service. I was included, I was inv- involved. And as I grew a little bit older, I went on to phase two. And when they began to give me a voice and a vote, a seat at the table, and I was involved in planning the services, planning the programs in church. In fact, when I was in my early 20s, I was assigned to be the finance director of our church. That means I was involved in planning the budget and and presenting the finances to our church. I was given a seat at the table. In fact, even in my 20s, I was already a board member in our church. I was literally given a seat at the table where we make decisions for the church at large. So leaders and pastors here, this is what you need to do. You know what? Give your young people a voice, a vote, a seat at the table. And today, you know, as a senior pastor of Heart of God Church, you know, I'm continuing to do the same thing. When I see a young person, I see a young Garrett in them. And I want to give them a voice and a vote. I want to give them a seat at the table because they are leaders of today. So at this point in time, you know, I talk a lot about us as the older generation. But I also want to speak to the younger generation today. I want to speak to the younger generation as a second generation senior pastor. You know, this is how... I see my role as a younger generation. You know, as the older generation respects and release me in my strength, you know what, I know as a younger generation, I also need to learn to honor and respect the older generation. You know, the image that I have in in my mind when I talk about rising up to be a second generation senior pastor is this. You know, I picture a building with many stories, many flaws in the building. You know, have you ever wondered why is it that the different flaws of a building is sometimes called the different stories? First story, second story, the third story. You know, one of the theories is that historically in the medieval times, when they built a building on the outside of the facade, they will have a mural that depicts a story. And when they built a second floor to that building, they will add on to that story. So on the outside, you can see the first story, the second story, and then the third story, so on and so forth. So as a second generation, as a younger generation senior pastor, 
where I have this image that we are continuing the story of the older generation. We don't want to destroy or demolish what the older generation has built. We are building on top of that. Amen. So we need to respect, we need to honor what the previous generation has done. We are stepping on their shoulders. We are only where we can only do what we do because of what they have done. In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells us this, and he's talking about the people of God. He's talking about, and that also references the church. And it says this, Paul says that as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And Paul here represents the older generation. But he goes on to say, and another builds on it. And that is the younger generation. And let us take heed how we build on it. So some principles we have for the younger generation is this, that the younger generation is building on the foundation of the older generation. Don't destroy, don't demolish, but there are DNA, there is values that the older generation has laid the foundation in your churches, in your ministry, that you should not take away. You should be building on top of that. And what else? Also, how should we do it? It's not just what we do, but how we do it. The younger generation needs to do it in a way that honors the older generation. Don't despise what the older generation have done, but we need to honor them, treat them with honor, treat them with respect, because we are only where we are today because of their sacrifices, of their hard work, of their, all that they have done and their obedience to God. Amen. So as the younger generation, we need to honor the older generation as well. So coming back to all the pastors and leaders here, you know what, if you want young people in your church, Guess what? You've got to give them a voice, a vote, and you've got to give them a seat at the table. Amen? Come on, let's give Jesus a big hand. Amen. Let's give Pastor Gary a big hand. Clap. So mindset shift number one is use our leaders today, not just tomorrow. Number two is generations. Now, mindset shift number two will be the following session because my wife, Pastor Lear, is going to preach about generations. It is her life verse. It is her life message. You know, let me share a little bit about my wife. How our church started was this. We started with very small, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 people. And with nine youths, we call them the nine stones. She will elaborate more later. And and she was leading the youth. I was leading the adult church. Me, the man of God. The anointed man of God. She leading kids and children. But in years later, her kids and children outgrew my adult church. Her church grew to the thousands whereas my adult church was only a few hundred people. So now, every day I come to her, I say, please do not leave me. (laughs) If you leave me, your church is bigger than my church. (laughs) She was the one who is the crusader for children. She is a champion for youth everywhere. And and right now, I'm talking about generations, but really, it's a burden that she carried. It's a vision that God gave to her from Isaiah 58, all the way back 25, 30 years ago. And, and it's amazing how, back in those days, 30 years ago, if you go to a conference, youth will never be the main topic. The main keynote speakers will never talk about youth. 30 years ago, Anything about youth is in the afternoon workshop where nobody goes. Because youth ministry were the lower level, the B-grade ministry. The real ministry is the adult church and the business people. But she has been banging the drums for young people for the last 25 years. So I'm glad you are here and you get to hear about this mindset shift you need to have. Generations. Amen? And with that, very quickly, I want to go into the last mindset shift. Number three, church is our home. Build your church like a home. 
like a spiritual home. And you must understand this. This is the most simple concept. You see, traditionally, we see it like this, that young people, you must believe first, then you become holy. Or in other words, you behave yourself. Only after that, then you belong. Then you are part of us, part of the church. And then we will give you church membership. That is the traditional way of seeing things. So you believe first, and then you become holy. You behave yourself. And with that, a lot of times, it becomes a outward behavior modification. They display what is outside because it is what the culture, the family, or the church wants. But on the inside, there is no real transformation. And then, finally, we say, oh, you say the right things, you behave the right way, then we will give you church membership. So, if you really think about it, we are telling our young people, you need to speak Christianese. You know what's Christianese? We all speak Christianese. Christianese is every sentence, you have a word, hallelujah. Every sentence, you must have the word, glory. And if your young people speak like that, okay, okay, now you belong to church. We get them to speak Christianese. We want them to believe not in Christianity, but churchianity. Churchianity is what the church believes in, the denomination believes in. But we don't lead them to Christ. With the new generation, you've got to swap it around. So look at the screen. Here is important, and it's so simple. Instead of belief become belong, the belonging comes first. Switch it around. Belong. Young people must feel like they belong to church, they have relationships, friendship, they belong, then they believe. Then they become, and they become real disciples. Not external behavior modification, but internal transformation by the power of Jesus Christ. So in our church, we would have young people coming to our church for six months, for two years, without getting saved. They will come. Why? We ask them, you are not a Christian. Why are you coming to church for every week, for two years? Because I feel so comfortable here, they say. Because my friends are here. Because I belong here. And I was quite disappointed. I thought they would say, because pastor, you preach so well. <laughs> because you are so anointed. No, nothing about me. It's all about my belonging. But guess what? Let me tell you, it's a feat to get a non-Christian to come to church for six months. It shows that your church is attracting young people. And these are not kids from Christian family. They have a choice not to come. But yet they come. But the power of God works in them gradually. Gradually, every week, every week. In six months, in one year, one day, the Word of God comes and it clicks. And then they get saved, radically changed. And then they become Christians. They believe in Jesus. Only after that, then we get them to become, become true disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? So that is why building a home is important. The church is not just a service. The church is a home. Our church is open from Tuesday to Sunday. Our church, when the kids come to our church on a Saturday or Sunday, they stay the whole day, literally. Not just for the two-hour service, but they hang out in church because they belong in church. Amen? And so with this, I have a testimony on video for you about this young boy. And through the video, through his testimony, you can hear about youth are leaders today and also the church is their home. So let's play the video. I can have a church now, but it, as an eight-month-old boy, I 
old Christian. I shared my testimony in a youth service. And once I got off the stage, Pastor came to me and said he was proud of me. He said I was a leader. The next moment, Pastor got me to join him on stage to pray for the youth. And honestly, I was shaking, but faith arose in my heart. I realized that even if I'm new, even if I'm young, God can use me. So, the next year, I was involved in planning a youth camp for 400 youths. We came up with many ideas and had a lot of fun. And with that, also came a lot of mistakes. But Pastor Ine and my leader, Inu, were super patient with us. They taught us to be administrative, to communicate, to think for others and to be team players. And because they guided us, the camp turned out great. And for the next camp, we got to guide a new and younger planning team. That's me! I was in the Life Fit Ministry. I actually got to use those cameras worth over 7,000 USD each at 14 years old. My trainers taught me how to operate the equipment and how to plan my shots. A year later, I rose up to serve as a camera director, coordinating shots from 16 different cameras during services. Pastor encouraged me and said, though you may be serving behind the scenes, you are very much part of the team. At 16, I became the youngest operations coordinator in church. I now coordinate between 8 different media departments. My leaders also taught me how to roster the crew, train them and to improve our syllabus and processes. As I grew, I started to train the next operations coordinator who, in fact, now is training the next generation of operations coordinators. There will always be new reinforcements in House God Church. Till today, we keep breaking the record and as of now, our youngest operations coordinator is 13 years old. Yes. Pastor Garrett kept encouraging me to rise up and to share my thoughts freely. I felt so believed in. Then, at 19, I was involved in running Heart of God Church Assemble. This was the first time our, we would ever gather in an external venue with 5,000 people all together. I helped to plan it from start to finish, from ideation to sourcing for the venue to coordinating all the setups and run-throughs, and I even liaised with the external vendors who were twice my age. When one of them found out that I was only 19, she was so surprised and asked if she could hire me. So what she didn't see was how my pastors and leaders guided me throughout the whole process. And after months of hard work, finally the day of HODC assembled came. I never imagined that at 19, I could be a part of making history. This is all possible only because God found me when I was lost. Actually, a few months after I came to church, my dad left my family. I just woke up one morning to find out that he wasn't coming back. The disappointment still hit hard. I told my leaders about it and as they prayed for me, I felt God's love and peace in my heart. When my earthly father left me, I know that my heavenly father never would. Pastors have always looked out for me. They treat me to meals, they buy me gifts, and they give me concert tickets. Pastor often says that what youths lack in experience, we can make up through exposure. So they brought some of us along to their family trip to Australia. Pastors covered the cost of everything for me. We went to many places, we laughed a lot, we ate a lot, and made a lot of memories. I'll never forget the morning Pastor handed me $300 in cash and told me to spend it on whatever I wanted. That was exactly how a father would treat his own son. He also shared his observations as we travelled and taught us how we can do the same. And after shopping, one afternoon, Pastor also prayed for my life and for my future. I had a glimpse of what my future family could be like, loving, warm and godly. I came as a 13 year old with nothing to give, but God has given me a home and a destiny. And that's why today at 20, I can be co heading the Operations Coordinator Department in the media team. My dream is to serve full-time in church and just as how I've been built and trained, I want to keep doing the same for others. Amen. Let's give it up for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So you can see right there, youths are leaders today, even when he is a, was a cute little boy, but also church is their home. And if church is their home, it is not just a slogan. It's not just something you put on the wall. They have to have real relationships. And if the church is the home, then the senior pastors must be the spiritual mom and the spiritual dad. So I want to say this. I, I, it may offend some people, but this is my heart. Listen, we are not just preachers. We are not just preachers preaching to a crowd. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus preached to a crowd too. But God is looking for shepherds. 
We are first and foremost shepherds who love people, love the young people. We are pastors. We are spiritual fathers and mothers. And when you do that, you not only raise up disciples, you raise up spiritual sons and daughters. That's how the church becomes a home for young people. Amen? Last story before I end. It started this way. This is when our church was maybe less than 100 people. One day I was preaching to the young people and it was Father's Day. So it was the week before Father's Day actually. And I was telling them, the Bible says honour your father. So this week, go home and prepare something for your father. Write a note, buy a little gifts, you know, do something to honour your father. And as I was preaching, I realized all the young people, they were not interested. They were disengaged. Now, usually they were very engaged. Usually they will say, Amen, Pastor. Preach it, Pastor. But that session, they were quiet. So it was strange. After the service, I went to speak to some of them. I said, Hey, what happened just now? It's not your usual. And they say, Pastor, you got to understand. Most of us here, we do not have fathers. Our fathers have left us. So for the regular kids in school, Father's Day is a good day. But for us, it's the worst day. Every Father's Day, when we see our friends celebrate with their fathers on Instagram, it just reminds us that we have been abandoned, we are not loved, and we are fatherless. That's why we, it's very hard for us to celebrate Father's Day. And I, I talked to Pastor Lear, and we found out it's exactly the same for Mother's Day. So we decided to make a difference. From that day on, 20 years ago, every Father's Day, I would write a letter to all the fatherless kids in our church. And, and I'll, tell, I'll write the letter like they are my children and I will buy them a little gift. And this is like a sample of the letters that I wrote. So let me read one to you. And if you, I encourage you to do that for the young men and the young ladies in your church. Write to them, write to them, encourage them. So it's like this. One of the letters is this. This is from 2014. And I have it all on my website, pastorhow.com. So if you want sample, but do not just copy and paste, <laughs> write with your heart sincerely, but to give you an example of how to write. 2014 Father's Day letter. On this Father's Day, I pause to thank God for you. I wrote to the young men and young ladies. I am proud of who you are and who you are becoming. My desire for you is that you live a great life. I pray that you have an abundant life on earth and a rewarding eternal life in heaven. I'm writing this as if you, I were writing to my own child. Number one, be hardworking. Tell yourself this, today I do what others won't, so that tomorrow I do what others cannot. Remember, success happens when opportunity meets preparation and abilities. Be ready. Number two, be grateful. Never forget where you came from. Never forget how far God has brought you. Never forget how God has rescued you. Never forget the family in church who love you. Never forget the people who believe in you when you were a nobody. And out of the 10 lepers healed by Jesus, only one came back to worship him. Be the one. If you notice, I write this, because they are fatherless. They did not have a father or a godly father to mentor them, to teach them. So it's our job to do it. Number three, live for the cause of Jesus Christ. William Carey, the great missionary, said this, I am not afraid of failure. I am only afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. So young people, live for things that matter in eternity. You are never a failure when you succeed in Christ. From your generations onwards, it will be different. I'm eagerly waiting to celebrate your success and hear your wow stories with love and respect. 
Asaha. Be a father to the young men, young people. So I talk to pastors who come for our conference and I say, don't worry if you think you're too old because a lot of people say, no, I cannot be in youth ministry. I'm too old. No, they are looking for spiritual fathers and mothers. You don't have to get tattoos and be cool. No, they have that on YouTube. You, they need a spiritual father and mother. And you know, ever since then, I talk to those same kids, every Father's Day, they are smiling, beaming, and I say, how's Father's Day? You know what they say? Father's Day is now the best day of my life. Every year, I look forward to Father's Day because all the kids with good families and parents, they don't get a letter from Pastor Howe. Only we, the broken kids, we get a letter from Pastor Howe. And we turn it around. And those letters, they tell us, they not only read it once that year, every, a few times a year, especially when they are discouraged, they will take their letters and they will read it to themselves. Let me tell you, those letters encouraging young men and young women will live longer than the sermons we preach. Ask the kid, what did you preach last month? They will not remember. But these letters that you write to encourage them will live with them for eternity. Amen? So listen, we are not just preachers. We are spiritual past fathers and mothers. We are shepherds. Amen? And with this, as you build your church like a home, guess what? The young people they will begin to take ownership of the church. See, sometimes we say, our young people, they are so disengaged. No, if you build it like a home, they will take ownership. For our church, the young people clean the church. They come to clean the church. They come to build the church. They come to give financially to the church, even though they don't have much money. You know, during COVID, I was so encouraged. There was no church service and then there were small church services. For two years, I realized Pastor Garrett was our financial uh, CFO. And he says, Pastor, this is incredible. During COVID, when we had no services, our income went up. I'm like, how did it happen? How come? He said, the people know that because there's a worldwide crisis and there's no services, they carried the burden. They took ownership of the church. So instead of tithing 10%, they began to tithe 15 to 20% because they have ownership of the church. Hallelujah. That's ownership. And I want to read to you one last text message from this girl in university. Just last year, we lost our youth center because we rented it and the landlord wanted to raise the rent to a ridiculous price that it would be foolish to continue the rent. So we lost our youth center where they come to hang out almost every day. And then when that happened, this young lady from university, she sent a text to her leader and she said this, God convicted me so much during that session. Initially, I was planning to go on a solo trip on a holiday to Bangkok in Thailand before I start school. But I felt so strongly in my heart to give the money to church, that money instead, because how could I be enjoying and having fun overseas when my spiritual parents are dealing with issue at home in the same month? It just did not sit right with me. So don't worry, SP, they call us SP. That trip doesn't mean much to me. I am a lot happier being able to stay home to build. Hallelujah. It's this kind of text that makes me cry all the time. Sometimes I don't need to preach to a crowd of thousands. Nothing wrong with that. But when you have spiritual sons and daughters in your home, and when your church is going through a crisis, they build the church. That brings you fulfillment. 
that shows that you have discipled well. That shows that you have raised up godly young men and young women. Amen? Hallelujah. So can we pray? Come, let's close our eyes and pray as we end this session. Father, in this first session, I pray that as you bless our ministry to be far and wide, to be big, God, you also raise up in our hearts, raise up leaders, men and women in this great nation who will be spiritual fathers and mothers. That we will shepherd them with the integrity of our hearts and the skillfulness of our hands. God, you are looking for shepherds. God, in Ezekiel, you are calling forth shepherds for a young generation. We want to rise up to be those shepherds that you can be proud of. I want to ask one last thing. Instead of just praying for bigger ministry, bigger churches, bigger impact, and nothing wrong with that, but can you add right now, pray that God will give you a bigger heart, a bigger heart, a bigger heart. If that's you, lift up your hands. Will you tell Jesus, God, give me a bigger heart. Not just bigger ministry, not just bigger buildings, not just bigger budgets. God, bigger heart for people, especially young people. Bigger heart for the sheep. God, help me to love them as you have loved them. Thank you, Jesus. Bigger hearts. Bigger hearts. Bigger hearts. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, God. Father, I pray you raise up in this great nation a whole new generation of pastors, men and women with big hearts for young people. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody say, come on, let's give Jesus a big hand clap. The Chief Shepherd. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
keep quiet. Okay? But um, listen well. Okay? Don't act fast. Listen well. So you don't scatter. Do you get what I'm saying? Because of you can get to the church, start fighting everybody. Listen very, understand what the spirit and their wisdom properly. I think one of the most powerful things was the way pastor how demonstrated that transition between him and Pastor Garrett. I don't, I don't think in all my over 30 years of ministry I've ever seen anything like that. All right, and that's modeling. That's showing you, not just teaching, demonstrating, all right, that particular thing. I've been following it online, and um, I mean comments online, and uh, the reaction online is extremely powerful. Our second session, after the second session, I'll announce something, but our second session will be Pastor Lea. Okay. I don't, I don't think, I think Pastor How has introduced her in all the, uh, the sharing. So let's just rise to our feet and welcome Pastor Lea. And uh, it's so good to be here this morning. And I realize, uh, first and foremost, I'm bringing you greetings from hot and humid Singapore. I realize that your climate is not very different from ours. And your church is not very different from ours in Singapore because basically we have two commitments. The first commitment in our church is to Jesus Christ. But the second commitment in our church is to air conditioning. So that's, we're very similar in that way. Please take a seat. <laughs> right, um, well, let me get my stuff right. So thank you, Pastor Poju, for having us here. It's such an honor to speak for you. Uh, well, a lot of our people back home were very excited when they found out that we're going to come to Nigeria for the first time. And so they're all going like, wow, you're going to see a lot of big, beautiful animals. You're going to meet a lot of majestic lions. And I go, nah, it's okay. We have already met the most majestic lion of all. When Pastor Poju came to our church several years back, we don't need to see any more majestic lions. So let's give Pastor Poju a big hand. And, you know, thank you, Pastor Toen. It's like, you know, we connected and I just love chatting with you. Um, and the essence that comes out of you is so beautiful <laughs> and so special. And I'm just so excited to watch what God is doing through your life. So thank you, everyone, who's been taking care of us. Uh, we've been so well taken care of. Uh, we are, you know, always with somebody and it feels so safe. Um, well, a lot of, uh, today I can see that a lot of beautiful men, good-looking men and women here in this hall. How many of you know that we need both men and women in the kingdom of God? Well, men and women, we are all so different, right? When, uh, you know, sometimes we wake up in the morning, we say, oh, I have nothing to wear. Well, when somebody says, I have nothing to wear, it's very different between a man and a woman. When a woman says that she has nothing, a man say, when a woman says she has nothing to wear, what she really means is that she has nothing new to wear. But when a man says he has nothing to wear, he means that he has nothing clean to wear. So, so if you're seated next to a very good looking person, right, you've got the wave a little bit to signal that you're sitting next to a very good looking person and I advise you to do so because you're gonna have the person next to you for the next one hour. So, you know, like how many of you are seated next to a very good looking person? Put up your hands. Yeah. Why did you turn to the person and say, I'm so glad that you found something new and something clean to wear?
I'm wearing a new shirt today. Right, so now today uh, I'm speaking on my favorite, most favorite topic, and which is about generations. Uh, many years ago, God spoke to me a verse, and it is my life verse. It is found in Isaiah 58 verse 12, and it says, You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. So it has become a live verse, and I've spent my whole life living out this verse. So now, when I'm talking about generations, it is not just about building the next generation or the next generation, but it is about building many, many, many generations of young people. When we say generations, people usually think of succession. People think of an older person retiring or passing away and then someone younger coming in to take over his place. Well, that is secession. But generations is not secession because secession is all about replacement. Generations are not replacements. Generations are reinforcements. Generations is about having many layers and many levels of leaders serving God at the same time. Nobody is being replaced, amen? So can you imagine if it is about secession, then it is too slow. Imagine a 70-year-old pastor looking for a 40 or 50-year-old pastor to take over, a replacement to take over his job. That is too slow and that is too late. So now, in our church, in Heart of God Church, my husband and I, we have been building young people for more than three, nearly three decades now. And in our church, we have built many generations of young leaders. And right now, at this point, we have already raised and built a seventh generation of youth leaders. And from, you know, one to two, two to three, between each generation, all seven of them, each generation is only three to five years apart. That's right, you heard it correctly. It's not a 40-year gap or a 20-year gap between generations of leaders, but every generation of leaders is only about three to five years apart. In our church, we raise up young people very intentionally. We are so deliberate in reaching the generations. So all these young people, they will come into our church when they're 13, 15, and 17, and now over the generations, over the course of history of our church, they have now grown up and they are now in their 20s and their 30s. And today they are pastors, they are leaders of hundreds and their heads of departments serving in our church. Now today we're going to do something really fun. I promise you it's going to be fun, at least for me. Uh, we're going to go through all the different generations so that you and I can get on a common page of what it really looks like. I want to put a visual picture in your heart, in your spirit, of what seven generations of young leaders serving God together in a church will look like. So I'm going to flash a few photos of each generation on the screen, but I need you to understand that these are just representatives of hundreds from their generation. I couldn't put them all on the screen, but just choosing a few. And so now, so I'm going to start showing you, but let me say this. The first generation that we had, we, we had a, a group of nine teenagers, just nine. And uh, they were just incredible kids, uh, incredible because uh, I call them the nine stones, right? I didn't call them the nine prophets, nine apostles, nine evangelists. I call them the nine stones because when they come for my meeting, they won't smile, they won't laugh, they won't sing. Now, I understand if they don't pray, they don't worship, they don't read the Bible, it's okay. We'll train you. But not only that, they don't respond when I joke. They don't, they don't laugh at my jokes, you know, so it's really hard and they won't have any expression on their face. Every time I sit down, I talk to them, I go like stone number one, stone number two. So it was really, really hard. But I told them, I say, you know, kids, the Bible says if you don't praise Jesus, these very rocks will cry out. And so I had faith that one day they will rise up and praise Jesus. And thank God they did. They got on fire. And they got so on fire that they praise God more than me right now. <laughs> so the first generation came when they were 10, 12, 13 years old. And now they are in their 30s. 
And out of the first generation of youth leaders that we have, we have managed to raise and recently raise three senior pastors. All right? So are you ready? I think it's going to be fun. All right? Um, are you ready to see the first nine or the first generation of kids who walked into our church? Ready? Right now. This is how they look like. All right, did you see that? They are all there, and you know, I can only show you six at one time. Now, this is the first generation. Now, look at this. They look in this, you know, walking in at eight years old, 13, 12, all look like they are the cutest things on the face of this earth. But now they are in their 30s. How many of you want to know how they look like right now? That's right. Now, they are in, 30s, in their 30s, and Pastor Garrett is 40. All of them have stayed in the house of God and served him and grew up in the church of God. And this is where they are. They're still in the house of God, and I'm so proud of them. And I want to just highlight a few people. That is Pastor Charleston. He came in at 13, very cute-looking guy. And now 36 years old, he's the other senior, one of the three senior pastors in church. Uh, he's the chief leadership officer. And he has got a Master's of Divinity from Aura Roberts University. So the next generation is always more qualified than all of us. Now, so just Pastor Chelsea, when he first came, he was a very, very interesting young man, quiet, but now he's serving God in the fullness of his glory. And then the next girl who came in at eight years old, um, always far more mature than kids her age, that is Pastor Lynnett. She came at eight, now she's 35. She is the third senior pastor in our church. She's the chief pastoral officer. So, you know, I'm the chief people officer, and I tell her you are the chief pastoral officer. Well, I, I'm chief people officer because I deal with the life once. You are the chief pastoral officer, we deal with the dead ones, the funerals and the stuff. Okay, that's bad, I know. Yeah. So, now she also has a Master's of Divinity from Oral Roberts University. And today, Pastor Howe, Pastor Garrett, and myself, we can be here because two other senior pastors are at home holding the fort and just running the church while we are here in Nigeria. All right, let's give Jesus a big hand. Okay, let's move on to the next person. Pastor Garrett is there. You heard him preach before. He's amazing. Came at 12, now 40. He is the chief executive officer. Again, Masters of Divinity, Master of Divinity from R. Roberts University as well. Now, this is very interesting. When Pastor Garrett was 25 years old, Pastor Howe turned to him and said, Garrett, I believe you can be the finance director today, from now on. And so he did. And then, but as our finance director, he ran into many obstacles while trying to function in that role because the auditors that he was dealing with just couldn't believe that such a young person could be a finance director of a church of quite a big size. And so nobody could believe that he's so young. So they keep coming to him and they say, Garrett, we need to meet your finance head. He say, I am the head. <laughs> I need to meet your boss. I am the boss. And so they even went to his team of accountants and they asked them, how old is your boss? And there was this particular auditor. She was a lady and she had so much problem trying to wrap her head around his young age that she, you know, she could just couldn't, she gave a lot of problems when she was working with Pastor Garrett. But guess what? She's no longer in the job today, but Pastor Garrett went on and excelled in what he does. And he became not just finance director, but he became CEO of the church. He became senior pastor of our church. So never look down on young people, amen? Now, this Tian Ming right now, he came when he was 14, chief operations officer, very mischievous boy. One day, we hope to tell you his stories. You will love him. 16 years old, already heading, when he was 16, he was already heading the entire Asher department today. At 36, he is the director of the entire guest experience team, leading a total of 13 ministries. Now, out of the first generation, we have also, besides just three senior pastors, we have raised one pastor from that first generation. His name is Daniel, Pastor Daniel. He's a pastor of doctrine. Came at 11, 39. Now, he has a master of theological studies from Regent University in the States. Worship leader, very anointed songwriter. You know, and he is also a pastoral leader of 220 people. 
Music and doctrine, that's a link. I don't know what the link is, but there's a link in Jesus' name. So he's the pastor of, direct, of doctrine. Now, this is Valerie Fifi, came at 16, today at 37. She is everything global in our church, a very key, key full-time staff. Amen? So look at this. These are all just representatives from one generation, the first generation. And today, many of them are still passionately serving God in their church all in their late 30s and then you know there's no replacement in heart of God church the only replacement that happens is they are being replaced in their cuteness generation they have now young kids let's take a look at them they've all been replaced in their cuteness the in their looks so this is where some parents move on now we didn't stop in one generation but we move on Deliberately reach a second young leader. And this is second generation. We have raised another pastor, Pastor Ilu. She, is, she has recently been installed as a youth, pa youth pastor in our church. And she came in when she was herself a teenager at 15 years old. She is leading 800 people, leading all the youth and the pre university demographics and some others. Now, this is uh, two more from this second generation, Megan and Daryl. Now, Megan came at 17, now she's 34, full-time staff, leading 640 people. And Daryl came at 15, now 33, full-time staff. And both of them have their Master of Divinity as well from ORU. They were the second batch of students that we sent after the first batch graduated. Then the next people, Sabrina, very anointed worship leader, came at 14, now she's 33, still singing for the Lord in the house of God. Then two youths in this generation, very interesting. They grew up to be doctors in Heart of God Church. Dr. Leonard came at 18, now he's 34. Dr. Tian came at 17, 36 this year. They became doctors, and both of them are on our church board. In fact, Dr. Leonard has been our board since he was 27 years old, and he's the youngest board member ever. So first generation, second generation, we didn't stop there. We went back down for another generation, the third generation of young leaders. Now this is how they look like. 13, 17 again, and then this is how they look like today. And all of them are in their 20s. So three to five years apart, every generation. Jeannie came at 13, full-time staff now, 29 years old, leading 150 people. She has also graduated with a Master of Divinity. And we always tell her, Jeannie, we're so envious of you that you got your Master before you turned 30. How many of you know that young people can do great things for God? Come on. So, now, Alicia is very important. She came at 17, but she's leading a very important demographic in our church, which is the teenagers. They are all below 13 years old. They always fall through the cracks. That age group, they always fall through the cracks. But now we have Alicia, full-time staff, came at 17, now 29, leading 80 teens below 13 years old in our church. Next person, Nicholas. Head of, head of events, head of our media department, came at 13, now 29. And, uh, well, how you recognize him? He's the most stressed out person every weekend in the media room. That's who Nicholas is. Uh, Pastor Ilu is his wife. And then Joel, our bassist, he came when he was 14, now he's 29. And uh, head of our sound team, he's our muscle guy, right? And uh, he's with us on a team this, this trip. And uh, he's clicking the slides right now. No stress there. Um, so now, Geraldine, you know, came in 16, now 31, province 18, 29. This is what it is. We kept going back down as the previous generation grows up. We keep going back down. We had a third generation. Layers and level of leaders leading at the same time. They are reinforcements, not replacements. While the third generation is serving, the first and second generation are still around, but leading at a higher level and capacity as time progresses. So within each generation, leaders are also going to new levels even as we keep going down for another generation. Then after the third generation, we didn't stop. We go back down for the fourth generation. That is before and after photos. That's how they look like, and this is how they look like right now. 
So this is waiter. He came at nine years old, now 26. All of them. And then Charmaine Lim, she came at seven. How many seven-year-olds are there in your church right now? She came at seven, but at 12, she was the youngest crew in the media department. At 14, she became the youngest leader in the Slikes ministry. Now 25, she's still serving in the house of God as a leader in our sermon screens ministry. How powerful is that for a church to have generations? They are all not replacing each other, but they are serving God at the same time. Nobody is being replaced. And then we go back for a fifth generation. We didn't stop. Fifth generation, this is how they look like. Again, 10 years old, 14 years old, 11, 12, all of that, now this is how they look like. They grew up serving in the house of God. We have a pair of twins there, Ross and Rich, came in at 12 and then 24 years old right now. You know, I always have a good time with two of them because I could never differentiate them, you know, like who is who. Now, if I do, I will go to, um, I will go to Rich and I'll go, Rich, oh, you are not Ross. And then I'll go to Ross and I'll go, Ross, remember, you're not rich. <laughs> and so <laughs> this is all of them, same generation, growing up together. Do you see what I mean? When I say generations, it is five generations at the same time. They are not coming in only when we retire, but they are coming in to reinforce us and not to replace us. They are the reinforcements in your church, the 13-year-olds, the 14-year-olds. And you know what? They are not only just involved in mass teams or worship teams, but also pastoral work leading other youths. And this, again, are just representatives of the hundreds of leaders in their generation. And again, we didn't stop at the fifth generation. We kept going on. We kept going on deliberately reaching downwards again for all the 13 and the 14-year-olds. And then now, you know what? We have a sixth generation. Look at them. This is how they look like. Well, building generations have come back to bless my own daughter, Rina is my daughter, and uh, she's with us on this trip as well to Nigeria. And this is how they look like. <laughs> That's right, let's give Jesus a big hand. And, and uh, Rina, at 19, um, she's turning 20 soon. At one point, when she was fully in pastoral ministry, she was leading 150 youths. And she's also a leader in a youth creative team, great evangelist, great heart for souls of creative young people. And as a leader in the sixth generation, she had pioneered a whole new initiative to reach the lost recently. And so this is Rena, and then Singy, he was also from my daughter's generation, sixth generation. You heard from him in the testimony earlier. Came to 13, now 21, very key person, Giselle came at 12 years old, playing the bass. Now she's already 20. And you know what? I look at her and I said, I love your hair. You know, the power of the bass is in the hair. And I say, you've got Nigerian hair. That's the power of the hair. You know, we love Giselle. And then Shini came at 11. And the cute little boy over there who loves cakes. Uh, apparently from the photo. But now at 23, he's a worship leader, very anointed one, and also leading 20 people. So this kid, he has gone from loving cakes to loving music, worship, and the presence of God. Hallelujah. Right. And then Kalissa Key, now she only came in when she was seven. Again, how many seven-year-olds are there in your church? Now she's 22, training other young keyboardists on the team, and she's our youngest worship director. Now, the next person, Henry, sixth generation, came to church at 14, now he's 21. He's a very creative, outside-of-the-box kind of guy. He's the lead IT developer and uh, a key person of the youth creative team. Now, we couldn't fly everyone in here to tell their stories, but thank God for technology, we have all their video testimonies. So right now, I want to show you a video testimony of Henry, and you're going to see how he thrives in the house of God. Are you ready? Let's watch the video right now. Growing up, my life was gaming, YouTube, and maybe a bit of homework. 
I was so bored that at 11, I started to have an interest in technology. I learned to code, explore apps in the Adobe Suite, and build robots. But I still felt purposeless until I came to How God Church at 14. When I was a new Christian, I really wanted to serve God. My leaders heard about how I explored the various Adobe softwares, so they deployed me in the media team. This time, I wasn't just experimenting. My trainers taught me to design the slides, operate the screens for service. During my first duty, I looked out of the media room and saw people worshipping, encountering God, and I thought, wow, I'm part of something that impact lives. I knew I wanted to live for God and keep serving Him. All this time, I was still into tech stuff. So, one service when Pastor Hal prayed for those who wanted to use their IT skills to serve God, I thought I can't wait to grow up, graduate, and serve in a greater way. That's when God told me, why wait till you graduate? Make a difference now. Who would have thought that now would be when COVID-19 hit? We were building our online church and my pastors and leaders remembered my love for IT. So they wrote me into the IT team. I was 16 years old, the youngest and the least skilled. But my ministry leaders trained me. They met me every week to look through what I programmed and taught me step by step on how I could improve. That's how I learned to build our online platforms from scratch. When I heard so many people were getting saved through the online services, I realized that I wasn't just exploring IT and coding for interest, but for impact. As I started to work on more projects, my pastors and leaders often asked me, so what do you think? What should we do? They were asking me, a 16-year-old, for input. One of those times, we were planning for our academic excellence program, which encourages the youth to do well and do good at the same time. With my friends Shini and Sing Yi, we were thinking, how can we make studying fun for everyone? What if we created an app for studying? It was just an idea, and we had no idea how to go about it just yet. But our pastor said, go ahead, let's try it. So we did. However, building an app wasn't as straightforward as I thought, so thankfully, my IT ministry leaders put a team together to help ideate, design, and code for it. After several late nights of experimentation, troubleshooting, and testing together, Study Buddy came about and the youths loved it. Through this, I learned how important it is to communicate, work as a team, and think for others. Another time, I had another crazy idea. You know how in concerts, there are LED wristbands that light up in sync with the music? What if we could do that in church? After all, if the world can be so cutting edge, what more the house of God? Such bands can cost thousands of dollars, but I thought if we could code an ad for it, we would save money for the church. So while I researched on how to do it, other ministries came in to help make it a success. We called it Xylopage. But guess what? The first time we tested it in a service, it kind of failed. But immediately after, the, the team came together to figure out what went wrong, and my IT leader also helped me troubleshoot and fix the program. And when we tried again, it worked and it was a success. The church used it while praising God. Afterwards, my pastors and leaders encouraged me, saying that it was my idea and all, but honestly, it was because they empowered and guided me so that this idea could turn into a reality. Some people may think all these ideas are just for fun, but one day over dinner, Pastor Nia told me, creativity is your strength, God has called you to innovate. She saw beyond the surface and called out my strengths. She also said that as an innovator, I needed to be exposed to more ideas and to push boundaries and to try new things. To give me that exposure, Pastor blessed me with tickets and brought me to see my first musical, my first circle show and art exhibitions. With this space to explore and create, more ideas came to life. We did light boxes for our Easter dance, used drones to film our Christmas video production, and many more. This is how youth like me are built and empowered in church. And ultimately, it's all for the next 14-year-old to enjoy church and find his purpose in God too. I'm so grateful that my pastors believe that youth are leaders today, not just tomorrow. They saw something in a 14-year-old me with not much skill or ability, that's why it's now my turn to train the next generation in the IT team. And now at 20, I dream of working full-time in church after I graduate. I want to always use my creativity and innovations to glorify God and build His house. That's right. Let's give Jesus a big hand. <laughs> so many creative young people in the youth. 
And so now that is Henry. And how many of you know that we need to create an environment in church where every kind of gifting in the young people can flourish? Amen. So now we had a sixth generation. You know, Henry now is about 20, but we didn't give up. I'm so happy to tell you today there is still a seventh generation of young leaders in Heart of God Church, or the 13, 14 year olds. We went back down and we reached them again. And let me tell you that we launched a group of leaders in Generation Alpha in 2021. This is how they look like 12, 13, 15, they are still in the house of God. And today I have no after photos to show you because this is exactly how they still look like. Um, a few years time, I, I'll show you more photos of how they have become, how, how they look like now. So listen, in our church, the training is not just in the worship team, the creative side, the stage, in the production team or in a media team. But like what Pastor Poju said, it is about behind the scenes, what we do to pastor the people. So we're not just actively training in all the production side, but we are also actively training younger youths in pastoral work. That's right, youths leading younger youths spiritually, giving Bible study, praying with them, walking alongside them with the app and flow of life. They are training and discipling and hand-holding the next generation pastoral leaders. Now, since this is a pastor's conference, I believe our attention span is slightly higher than most people. So I'm going to take you through some things that we do in church to flesh out for you how it works for pastoral care. All right, pastoral ministry. So what happened is, if you remember my daughter, she's the sixth generation. She's a very strong pastoral leader. She started leading at 11 years old. 11, we already allowed them to lead, hand-holding them, teaching them the next steps of training the younger youths. So at one point as a teenager, she was leading a total of 150 young people. And amongst the whole group, she poured her whole life, her energy, and her efforts into three girls that were super close to her, and she just poured her life into their lives, training them to be pastoral leader. And the three girls are Jenna, Jamie, and Jermaine. Yeah, sometimes I go to my daughter and say, do you only lead girls with a name starting with J? Like, so Jenna, Jamie, Jermaine, and all they need is Jesus. So that's where it is. And now Rena is turning 20 this year. And the three key leaders that she's been leading since she was like 13 years old, 12 years old, all the three girls she has trained are now raising other pastoral leaders themselves. In fact, at 10 years old while they were in children's church, Rena was already trying to make a 10-year-old Jermaine feel really welcome as a 10-year-old. I don't know what they did. Probably, you want some sweets? You know, want balloons? You know, but she did. She caused, you know, them to feel, to remain to feel more comfortable. Then, let's see right now. This is going to bring excitement to all pastors' heart. Now, the three leaders with the names J, they are all full-fledged leaders in their own right. Very quickly. Let's look at this, right? So, Rena is from the sixth generation, leading 150 at one point. She was then leading, then Jenna has now become 19 years old, one of the J's, has become 19 years old, and she's leading 85 people right now. And Jenna didn't stop there. She herself is training a leader from the seventh generation, Jen Alpha, who is 17 years old right now and leading 20 people. She's also leading just 17, 10 people, 17 years old, 10 shoot there, the training line down for Jenna. Jamie is the second line out of Rena's generation. Rena trained Jamie. Now Jamie is already 20 years old. They all grow up so fast. And now Jamie herself is leading 70 youths. And she is now going back down to the seventh generation to train Leanne, 16 years old, who is leading 20 people. That's not the end of the line. Rena has a third line. She poured her life into Jermaine. Jermaine is now 20 years old. She's leading 30 people, a very strong media department leader as well. But Jermaine didn't stop where she was. She is now leading a seventh generation new leader named Jaina, who is 18 years old and leading five people. Friends, this is the power 
of training the next generation, the next generation. This is the power of raising generations in your church. So this is how it goes. Nobody is being replaced. They are all imparting and training the next generation that comes through. So this is where it is, right? Jaina with Dana, Jamie with Leanne, Jeremy with Dana, and all of them were trained by Rena. But guess what? Who trained Rena? Who was Rena trained by? None other than a leader in the second generation, Pastor Elu. She was the one who trained Rena. But then who trained Pastor Elu? Who got to train in pastoral work? And there's none other than someone from the first generation, Pastor Lynette. So Pastor Lynette from first generation, train the second generation, second generation, train the sixth generation, and the sixth generation is now training the seventh generation. And they are all now passing down pastoral principles, the heart of loving people. And they are now passing down generational hearts for other generations to rise up. Nobody is replacing anybody. They are all still in church serving God together. All seven generations still together because generations are not our replacements. They are our reinforcements. And we need them in the house of God. Amen? Now, so how do we raise generations of leaders being just three to five years apart? And I know this is a question in many people's mind. Well, usually churches just have one group, one youth group, and one revival. And then they transition them to the adult services. But for us, we do it differently. For us, every few years in Heart of God Church, we start a brand new youth group as the preceding generation grows up. So each youth group have their own services. They grow up and they grow old together as a generation. We are very intentional in reaching them because, like Pastor House said, it's a moving target. It is like running down an upward escalator. They grow up so fast. We are so deliberate. So every few years, we start a brand new youth group as the older generation grows up. So let me show you how it is done. 1999, I started the first youth, remember, a teenage group of nine stones. Then that is where they are. They got on fire for Jesus, but we didn't stop there. I went back down for another generation. So I took a few of the first generation leaders with me and started a new zone for the 13 to 14 years old. And we named that zone, Zone F, thinking it's the zone of the future. How many of you know that the future grows up really fast? They are no longer the future. They are now as well. So Zone F started with 20 people, but in 2013, we started another brand new youth group of 13 to 14 years old. We call it Zone M, the Millennial Zone. And it was launched with 114 people. Then a few years later, 2016, we started a new zone. The age of the people, we call it the Gen Z generation. They were, average age was 12.9 years old. And then recently, 2021, we launched yet another youth zone, Zone A, Generation Alpha. 200 people when we first launched with an average age of 13.4. Each generation grows up and grow all together. In each generation, there are hundreds of volunteers, hundreds of leaders serving together and growing up together. This is how we do it. Every few years, we go back down, start a new youth group. Amen? Now, I want to put a reality check here. All I've been telling you are all the good news and the fruit of nearly three decades of labor. Pastoring a church of young people can be both a joy and a pain. It's very interesting. You know, the Bible says this, right? If you want to build young people, you must be prepared. We didn't grow a strong church overnight. It was a very long process and sometimes painfully so. Proverbs 14 says this, Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You see, an ox will always bring strength. Where there is no ox, there will never be a mess. The place is always clean. But with oxen around, it will always be messy. An ox is like a youth. Where there are on fire youths in your church, there is a strength in the church. But remember this, where there are youths, there will always be mess. There will be disorganized workspaces, miscommunication, missed deadline, last minute work, new equipment getting broken, adult feelings getting hurt, you know, all of that. So youth equal mess. So can you imagine our, our church, so many young people. Many years ago when I first pioneered the youth group, they were all in a small room together with me. 
And it was such a small room, it was overcrowded. There was no place for me to even stand and properly teach them. So I had to sit on top of a table in that tiny office. Now, this room is also where the adult ushers were bringing the offering every weekend to keep in the safe. So for a few months, I saw the adult ushers coming in, and they were doing this in the room. And they brought the offering to put in the safe. And I go, what's wrong with you? You know, and after a few months, I go like, what are you guys doing? What, what is that? You know? And they go, pastor, you don't? I say, I don't what? <laughs> you don't smell it? I go, oh. And then it hit me. Rather, it hit my nose. <laughs> when you have a group of young people in a room, and when they take off their food day in school, when they take off their shoes, oh man, you can smell the smell of revival. <laughs> and so a lot of people will come and prophesy, you will hear the sound of revival. But to me, I'm saying, you know, I've never heard the sound of revival, but I have smelled the smell of revival in my whole life. So young people, they bring a strength to your church, but be prepared for things to be broken. Amen? It's going to be a mess. And so for me, I was just so happy to build generations of young people. Um, you know, so what happened is there's generations, right? That's how we've been Generations is how we ensure longevity, renewal, and endless pipeline with ignited youth volunteers and leaders coming through. So the younger people are not replacing the older generation, but reinforcing them. Nobody is being replaced, all seven generations serving together. Friends, in your churches, when you keep reaching for the generations, your church will grow younger. And when your church grows younger, it will grow stronger. That's how generations will come to bless your church and your vision. The young generation coming through means that there is a constant pipeline of leaders. And I'm going to show you a video right now done by Dr. Robbie, our clinical psychologist friend who has visited our church many, many times. And this video will give you a glimpse of how the levels and layers of videos, of leaders that is coming through. All right? Now, in this video, remember the little kid in the media department? His name was Singy. Well, he was, he's now in this video as well, but he's a lot grown up now in this video, and he's still serving in the house of God. So if you are ready right now, Let's see how a pipeline of leaders will come through in our church. Let's roll the video. Every time I come to Heart of God Church, I'm always amazed. They seem to be taking new ground, but it's not always the same old leaders, but rather Heart of God Church are intentional about building a pipeline of brand new leaders and volunteers every year. It's kind of what Pastor Leah refers to as the deep bench, where we've got both levels and layers of leaders, all with equal caliber, serving at the same time. And that's what I'm here to show you today. Come on, let's take a look. Hi, Hi Dr. Robbie. Hey guys, what's going on here? We are now preparing for a photography training for our youngest photographers. Youngest? What? So you mean you're not the youngest? I'm already 15, but now I'm training photographers as young as six years old to shoot in our main services. Okay, okay so but you must be like a photography legend. Oh no, when I first joined the ministry at 12 years old, Winnie trained me from scratch, and now she's training me to train others. Wow, so how is it that you train such young photographers? We actually adapted our main training syllabus to teach them how to use professional cameras and to also plan their shots. Yes, and you know, after services, we actually evaluate their photos and debrief them as well. Now that's what I call intentional. And here they come! Hi, Doctor! Hey, Hi, guys! Doctor. Now, how old are you? I'm eight. I'm seven. I'm six. Shall we take a selfie together? Yeah, come on, let's grab a selfie! Okay, so you need to send me that photo. Hey, look, I hope that this encourages you that anybody can build a deep bench. All you need is a heart for young people, just gather them together and start training. That's how Heart of God Church started. But then they took their trainings and turned it into a syllabus for their pipeline. Oh wait, I see somebody familiar. Hey, hey Sing Dr. E. Robbie. So good to see you. Good now, see you. the first time that we met, you were only 15. And I think at that time you'd only been in church for like a year, but you were already the camera director and in charge of something like 16 cameras. Is that right? Yes, so that was four years ago and I'm currently 19 years old, so time flies. Wow, very cool. And what are you doing now? So currently I'm an ops coordinator and from directing 16 cameras, I'm now training ops coordinators who direct eight different media departments to run our services. Uh, 
Amazing. Yes, so George over here is also an ops coordinator and he is only 16 years old this Hi, year. Hi George. Hi Dr. Robin. So in fact, Singy was the one that actually trained me and now together we are also training the next generation of ops coordinators together. So we're doing a debrief and evaluation uh, of the past two weekends. Uh, George over here actually led the team in Imaginarium to run services while I led another team to run and set up services at another venue for 5,000 people. Another team? So you have more than one team? You've got two full teams? Actually, we have one more team and that team is resting. So in total, we have three teams. Wow, multiple teams, equally skilled, and you've even got enough space for one team to be resting. So wait, what, what is it that you do? Oh, I'm the team that's resting. <laughs> Alright, jokes aside, I oversee the media and events department in our church. Okay, so tell me your story. How did you get here? So, it's all about training. I joined the Lights Ministry when I was 13 years old, and at 16, Pastor Lea challenged me to lead the entire Lights Ministry. And that's when I started to train Lights Crew, and that freed me up to become an Ops Coordinator. And as an Ops Coordinator, I started to train others like Sing Yi and George, and that allowed me to take on even more. Wow, now some leaders are a little bit hesitant to train up others for fear of being replaced, but you clearly don't feel like that. Yes, definitely not. Pastelier taught us that generations are not replaced Pastor Har and I believe in. Empower the youths. Don't entertain them. Don't build your youth ministry on entertainment. And I know sometimes when we're leading young people, we feel a tremendous pressure to be the, the fire eater, the circus act, the juggler, the clown, all rolled into one because we just need to entertain them. Well, don't get me wrong, entertainment is important when you want to win the new friends. The games, the fun is important when you're reaching out to unsafe people. But what I'm saying here today is don't build the youth ministry purely on entertainment. Amen? Empower your youths. Don't entertain them. Instead, you've got to guide them, lead them, disciple them, train them. And don't babysit the young people. Because if you babysit the youths, you will get babies. But if you lead the youths, you will get leaders. Amen? Empower them. Empower them to serve and to lead. And when you do that, you will be amazed. Because over and over again, we've seen in the last 30 years of ministry that empowered youths become producers. Entertained youths become consumers. So we need a church of producers, not consumers. Very quickly now. In the first, you know, our young people, they are empowered to serve and lead in different ministries across the church. So every year we have what we call a reinforcements weekend. And this is where we deploy and release and launch hundreds of teenagers like them into ministry. It is like their graduation from training schools. There is like a, a rite of passage. They are released into the front lines to join the teams, permanently serving as a volunteer. And look at their ages. I mean, they are 12, 13 years old. They are 10, 11. And look at the, the photography department. Look at them, how young they are. They were training. Six, seven, eight years old. We already released them and empowered them to serve God. And then this can happen in your church. Imagine all the different departments listed on screen. Hundreds of youth serving. They are your reinforcements. That's how you can build a strong church and that's how you can build a deep bench. See, the pipeline of youths and leaders and volunteers coming through, it creates a deep bench in our church. The deep bench is a key concept in Heart of God Church. It's a sports term. I used to be a sports journalist. My husband and I, we love sports. And deep bench, what it means is that when one team is playing on the court, there are equally skilled others sitting on the bench ready to play any time. Having a deep bench in church means having many layers and levels of leaders and volunteers all with equal caliber serving at the same time. 
This is why we have a constant pipeline of new young leaders, new volunteers coming through as reinforcements because we are relentless in empowering the young people. There are many iconic photos in our church featuring the deep bench. Here is one of them. There's Benny, taken in 2009. This is Benny, and he was too short to serve on the lights ministry, 12 years old. But we had to take a stool and let him stand so that he can reach the lights console. Nevertheless, nobody is too short nor too young to be trained in church. So there is Benny, and that is his trainer, and that is the trainer's trainers. Three generations serving at the same time. And there's so many similar images of this taking place in Heart of God Church Department. This is one from a photography team, very quickly. And then here are also the dramas all across department. We are training, worshiping, three dramas. And the most recent thing that we've implemented in our church is that we now have two drum kits on stage so that the young person drumming not only just have lessons in the school of worship, but he can be on stage having real life training in a real service, ministering to the adults. Amen. So photos like these, it flesh out the concept of deep bench in our church. And this is biblical. 2 Timothy 2.2 talks about few generations of people. That's Paul, that's Timothy, that's faithful men, and there's others that's mentioned. Paul to train Timothy, Timothy to train faithful men, faithful men to train others. Three generations of views are all reflected in these photos. All right, so let me show you um, how in other departments it works, and I'm going to invite a person on our team to share his testimony right now. Not only pastorally, but on the worship team, we also have a training. And as you can see, um, on the worship team in the base department, the point of origin was Peg Lian from the first generation. She trained Mark from second generation and Joe from the third generation. And then Peg Lian and Joe combined powers to train Giselle from the sixth generation and Mark Leong from the seventh generation. And today, I want to bring up someone in this training line to come up and share his testimony. Everybody, please put your hands together and let's welcome Joel Ng. That's right. He was 
just nine years old then, and he made his debut in our police service. He is now 11 years old, and we are still training him. The spirit of deep bench and training will always go on in the heart of the church. When I look at him, I'm reminded of how I came as a youth, and all that God and my pastors and leaders have done for me. Because of that, I'm here today living out my dream and my calling. Currently, I'm working full-time in church. I'm heading the sound department. I'm a music director and also a trainer of the worship team. Just like how I was loved and built, I want to do the same for the future generations. Thank you. Let's give Joe. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Definitely not an average Joe. Well, in Heart of God Church, there are many testimonies like this, and I know that some people here are always thinking, how do the older generations give and impart so freely to the next generation? Well, the thing is this, they themselves have been loved, and they know now they can go love others and train others in the same way. Amen? So, in our church, we always tell the younger generation, you have to respect the older people. They have sacrificed for you. They have just given their skills freely to you. You have to honor them. And then we turn to the older generation and we tell them, you know what? The young people, they are not here to push you out, but here to push you up. And in illustration, in the worship team, this is Pastor Daniel and this is Giselle. Both of them, in between them, they are 19 years, there's a 19-year gap. But the first generation, Daniel, and the sixth generation, Giselle, they serve on the worship team on a regular basis. Nobody's being replaced. But yet, because Giselle rose up on the worship team and served more, Pastor Daniel is released with more time. And that reinforced what he wanted to do, which is to write songs. So his songwriting opportunity to write songs recently with Grammy Award winner Matt Redman. And Daniel has been doing that because he's been reinforced. He's not been replaced and he's been pushed up, not pushed out. And so he can do what he wanted to do and he's been promoted to the pastor of doctrine recently. Friends, you've got to build generations in your church. And when you intentionally focus on young people and young adults in your church, your church will not only grow bigger, but they will grow younger and stronger. And together, we can do this. Amen. And I'm going to end with this. When my husband and I, we started the church, we didn't have time nor money to study for our, minister, our master of divinity. We just went to a local Bible school. But when we had money and we could afford to, we decided to send our next generation of pastors to study instead. So we sent them to the States, ORU, Region, University. Our pastors, they have MDiv, but Pastor Howe and I, we don't. But we, when they graduated, we were so happy. We flew to the States to just celebrate. And so recently, we have... just make us so happy because the younger generation coming they should always be better and greater and so I have one last video to show you and we will end friends after nearly three decades of building reinforcements in heart of God church you know what it's come time for us to build our own pastors and I'm saying and challenging you today that if you hang on to it enough and keep building generations, you not only build volunteers and leaders, but you will grow your own pastors. You will have your own reinforcements of senior pastors. We have recently promoted Pastor Garrett being one of them, three people to senior pastors. And they are homegrown senior pastors. They came in their youth, but now they're in their 30s and they're 40. And we have not only done the senior pastor's promotion, but we've also appointed four other pastors. So many homegrown, all homegrown. They are not hired from other churches. Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that it's wrong to hire from other churches. What I'm saying to you is that generations have given us an opportunity to raise homegrown pastors. They are like your spiritual sons and daughters, and they carry the DNA of the church, and they carry your heart. And so, when they can do that, they will not split the church with you. Of course, I'm not naive. There will always be people who will still betray you, leave church, you know, after all you've sown into them. But the good people, they will always stay. 
and they're grown in-house, homegrown. They carry your heart. They carry your vision. They carry your DNA. So now in our church, there's not only just a, a long line, of, a pipeline of ops leaders, volunteers in all departments. Now we have a pipeline of pastors and senior pastors. So kids from the first generation, they came when they were youths and now they are senior pastors. And you know what? Pastor Garrett being on us with this trip, we're so proud of him. A capable young man, God-honoring man that you see today. What you saw in Pastor Howe and Pastor Garrett that Pastor Garrett is found in your youth group right now, is found in your children's church right now. You can have your own pipeline of homegrown leaders. Amen. So I have one last video to show you, and I'm going to end. And uh, this is showing, showcasing the three senior pastors we've raised. They grew up as trench buddies, and now they not only have God, they have each other in this journey as they serve Jesus. And this is their journey. That's right. I'm just going to close. Would you just kindly stand up with me for the last one minute of this session? Last week, when we stepped foot on your continent, Pastor Garrett, being the spiritual man that he is, he said something. He said, wow, this is our first time here. And you know, something in me, in my spirit, just jumped at his comment. There's just something special about setting foot physically in a place, in a nation because you get to just feel the heartbeat a little bit more of this nation. And you get to really see all the work that has been done. And I want to say that my heart is filled with respect for all of you here, the work you've done and the people you've pastored and the churches you've built. I'm not here today to tell you what to do. And I'm not here today to tell you what to change. But I'm here today to encourage you to just add another lens 
onto how you see church. Last week, with my foot on your continent, I had a dream, a spiritual dream in the night. And I dreamt Nigerian children, they were hugging my leg and holding my hand and they were leading me through all the places to see where they play. And I look into their eyes and they look into my eyes. And you know, I was so happy in the dream. You cut me open, I bleed young people. And I look into their eyes and they embrace me and I was embracing them. But I just feel in my heart to release in this session a word. And I feel God is saying, empower the youths. Don't just embrace them. Don't just love them. We are very good at loving young people. But let's not just embrace them. Let's empower them. And today, I'm not just bringing you a message to teach you. But I'm bringing with me an anointing. Not that I'm any bigger or cleverer. But it's just that I'm bringing you an anointing from a life that has encountered God seeing how He moves and builds strength in the church when we as pastors release and unleash and empower the young people in our midst. And so you've heard my message and we'll pray for you. And I'm going to release an anointing over the hearts that are open. Father, I did not just come here to bring a message. I come here to bring your heart for the young people. God, it is hard work. It can be challenging. It is external but I know, and God, it is very that sitting among short here are people with a heart that so is burning people, for young people. They have different circumstances and if it is not, I pray happy. you will ignite the hearts that will burn God with young people a passion for them to not just embrace them but to empower them in the name of Jesus I call forth churches that would just be beaming and teeming with young people in the midst that it's just going to be babysat in the services but they will be released and unleashed and empowered to serve in the house of God in the name of Jesus I release the anointing that will raise generations of people. It will start in this conference. It will start in Nigeria, but it will go forth into the surrounding places. Oh, I know it in my heart and I see it in my spirit. Oh, I call forth churches with a heart, unrelenting heart for the young people. I call it forth right now in the name of Jesus. God, unleash your church to empower the young people this day, today, Lord. We believe unless you build a house, we labor in vain. We do not just work at the hard work, but we need your anointing, God. The anointing to build the young people. Right now, we release the anointing to build young people in this service, right now in this session. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, the face of youth ministry will change. It will turn. It will shift. Empowered youths, not just embraced. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Jesus a big hand. Thank you. seated. I, I just want to say to Covenant Nation people, huh? you, you know the husband man that laboreth must be the partaker. Uh -huh. So we are all here, you know. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have to exemplify it. Do you, are you following what I'm saying here? Because uh, I'm free like this. I'm a free, free person. All right, so when I came this morning, 
I was supposed to take the first session, then Pastor Howe and Pastor Lea. When I was inside the green room, I, I just knew, don't take any first session. So I approached Pastor Howe, you take the first session. Pastor Lea, you take the second session. I, you, you follow what God is, is leading you. We, we are not interested in grabbing the mic. Are uh, you following me? They're not, they not interested in that. So, having said that, because of the depth of what we have heard, I decided to forego my own session today. The third session will be a question and answer session. So, during this break, write your question. You hear what I say? Because if you ask when you hear it fresh, you, you, you will go home with it established. So, we'll have a question and answer session for an hour with them where you can ask practical questions about, you know, areas, and then they will answer um, those questions, okay? This is an apostolic conference, if you understand what an apostolic work is, which is breaking into new territories, all right? And I told myself beginning of this year, if anything is not apostolic, I'm not doing it, okay? That's if we are not forging the purpose of the kingdom of God. I, I'm not coming just to have a meeting for the sake of a meeting right there. All right. They brought physical books and electronic books, which are the electronic books are free. It's the same thing in the physical book, electronic book. There are only 2,000 copies to download. The first 2,000 people that download it and then it closes. So I'm going to put it up at a certain time in this conference. <laughs> and I'm also informing the people online. It's all right. So before we start the third session, we'll put the QR code and everything, and you go. Whoever gets it, gets it. Whoever doesn't get it. That's the only fair way to do it, OK? All campus pastors in, in um, Covenant, don't download. I will give you, I will give you a book, okay? If husband is downloading, wife shouldn't download. <laughs> <laughs> Except what you are saying is, we don't know who we, who, we, who we get it, so let's both go for it. All right, finally, before we go for the break, you know, we always play um, some games with our guest ministers, either football or this. So I want to play a video. I think it's the first video I saw of when I went to check um, Heart of God Church. I saw it and I was blown away by this video. And so because of that, I have to tell Pastor How and Pastor Leah, we've set up a tennis court, all right, outside where we're going to you, you, you will play light game of, of tennis. Aha. Yes, because I saw this video and, and it looked like you could beat Nadal. <laughs> 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 All right, play the video now. But you see, look at the way they use tech in that church. Play the video, please. The problem with happiness is that it is highly dependent on circumstances. It is external and it is very short-lived. So different people... They have different circumstances under which they are very happy. Some people say, I'm happiest when I can play against Nadal. That's right. Take that, Nadal. And then, of course, what happens is that Nadal disappears and your happiness also disappears. Somebody say, what would really make me happy is so I can see and play against Federer. And so Federer is here, circumstances are right, and I'm really very happy. And so you play Roger Federer. And you are the happiest under these circumstances. But then of course, guess what? Roger Federer disappears, and then you are unhappy again. But honestly, let me tell you, the circumstances under which I'm the happiest, it is to play this man right here, and his name is Pastor Howe. Yeah, 
Come on. Take one more, baby. Okay, one more, one more. Just one more for you. <laughs> That's right. Last one, baby. <laughs> Let's give the screens team a big round of applause. What's it? Amen. That's Churchill. <laughs> you are preaching a message. That's what you are doing. All right. Okay. And please don't forget tomorrow, plus all the young people watching, we're having a youth rally. All right. In the evening after a finished session. By tomorrow, we're going to have a runway here. All right, for our youth rally. Great man, Takit, will be here for it also. All right, and he's going to have, that's in the evening. Fortunately, they've added one more day for public holiday. So the public holiday is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you don't have any pressure of going to school. So please bring all your children, bring everybody in for the meeting. Are you, you understand what I'm saying here? Yeah. You know, if you listen to this, you know, you know, maybe you should listen to it first. Now that you heard it first, so you can go home and share it. So that when they come, it will look like you two are part of, because if they hear it, they'll say, you've been holding us down. <laughs> all right, then. All right, let's allow our guest ministers to leave and then... Okay. We will be back at 10 minutes past one for the last session. 10 minutes past one. All right. There is, it's there, right? There is the food stall out there on the right if you want to eat something. All right, then. God bless you. 10 minutes past one.
day one of the pastors' conference. We are live at TCN Igomo, right beside the National Theatre. My name is Sholakbe, and with me are Pastor Dewumi and Dr. Foy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so if you've been with us, you would agree with me that there's been an amazing experience yeah. at the Pastors Conference today. And I'll just quickly like to ask Dr. Foy. Dr. Foy, you're one of the promoters of Afro Gospel, and we've just heard like a lot about involving young people in church. What do you think about this? What was the experience um, like for you? So first of all, it stretched me. That pastor, how should be called? How? How? <laughs> knows how? How can six years old kids? So it stretched me. Um, I was first trying to find the the fault, in like we are, we, in, mm. in Nigeria, the application. The application like, there's tradition here. We're very respectful here. But honestly, I think I see the possibility. Mm. I see the passion, and I see that the future of church lies in the youth. When he said that the, the GDP of the country, the age. Age. Do you know how do you know how old Nigeria is? Yeah. Nineteen years old. Yes, eighteen point five. Nineteen yes, years old. So Nigeria is nineteen years old. So mm. if your church, you do the median, and your church is forty, my brother and sister, your church is, is on the verge of And he, he was very blunt. It was very blunt. Um and I would say that it, it would take a lot of repenting from everybody, mm. from the youths and yeah. from the I'm not, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s, I'm no more youth. <laughs> from, from what I've seen, 14 years old is there. <laughs> so it would take a lot of repenting, a lot of um, adjusting, but I think that's the future. Mm. I think that's the future, honestly. Um, it's been amazing, it's been stretching. In about five minutes, we go for questions. I want to ask questions about how they've been able to handle the mess. Because she said that when there's youth, there's strength, there's the ox. But there's, there's also the how have you been able to handle the mess? How have you been able to handle the transgenerational? Because, yeah. see, they have a deep bench. Yeah. To have a deep bench, that means you have to allow people to play. Yeah. In Arsenal, Odigar has been playing. Odigar. <laughs> Odigar has been playing. But here, you have to, so it's just, it's, it's, the, it's amazing how they've been able to, um, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, Pastor Patrick, thank you. I'm honored to be just in this space. Mm. It's mind stretching. And the use of technology, that's the part that I want us to quickly embrace. Because, yes, you might spoil expensive equipment <laughs> and they'll conquer you, Nigeria. <laughs> they'll flog you. But the, um, it's amazing. See, see that guy who, 19 years old boy, created that whole software? Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm blown away. I'm, I'm blown, blown, blown. Um, I love that Pastor Hal also respects the vision of his wife. Mm, yeah. Because she's like a pioneer. She's like yeah, the one who... So he, he doesn't... It's, it's, it's just... It's that, man. It's, it's incredible. Honestly, Thank you very much. Doctor. It's incredible. Thank you. It's, it's very. Pastor, we have used pastor, so I'm sure you were just there. Like, this is my thing. What do you think about? Uh, for me, um, it's the it's the mindset they they give to their young people yeah. that they they have responsibility, not just consumers. Because one of the things that personally I have noticed in pastoring young people is that the generation is a consuming generation. They want to. It's about, it's almost about receiving and just being, let your needs be met. People attend to your mental health, yeah. just ensure that you're fine, kind of thing. You want to be in a safe space. It's not really about getting out of your comfort zone to be a blessing, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I like the leadership culture in the church and leaders are people that take responsibilities. So it's not even about the position now. It's about the fact that everybody understands that I'm, I'm producing something. So the, uh, for me, that's one of the things I'm, 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 I'm trusting to imbibe in my, in my church and even beyond. And just to add, um, when Paul sent Timothy, Timothy was 17 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. Timothy was actually 17. Because I remember studying uh, and that verse where he says, um, you have the mind of Christ. Mm. Yeah. He was 17 when he was told. Yeah. I would also add this. I will say that one thing that we, we have to take away from here is that um, responsibilities is not about age. Yes. Yeah. It's not about it. And that stretch me is about so we also have to look for people that that are have, that are responding. Because most times we, we we there's a pecking order. But also dear leaders, we have to find those who yes. are who 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 are there committed. They might be young, yeah. And it's a the small thing. I remember so, so yeah. one of the one of the persons that is even doing the protocol in our in our church how did i how did i even find that he was good at that 
we were coming from church and he was a member at that time. He wasn't even a leader or a worker. He just comes and says, ah, Pastor, I noticed that this AC air condition is this and it's dropping in front of people. And he just did something about it. So I noticed that, even that small attitude. Yeah. And then the next time I was looking for somebody to handle Cost that thing I gave to him. And it's the, it, I just discovered that it's the same spirit. Yeah. It's actually not in the big work or the small work. It's just having the mind to serve is all the person needs to be yeah. in that in that space. Yeah, I would like to speak for the young people because I'm quite young. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, okay. No. Um, I'm not uh, I grew up in the yet. church. I, I was in church at a very, very young age. And I think what stood out for me for him was when he said, we need to move from a culture of people um, is it believing, um, behaving, then belonging. So first of all, belong, then you now believe, believe then, then you become, yes. Yeah. So um, I think growing up in church, um, we, had to, we had to behave. You had, we were very, it was very easy for us to pretend. Mm. So if you grew up in church, it's very easy for you to just adapt to your environment. And that transformation wasn't there. So I think in Nigeria, we need to be very open-minded to just making them belong. Let them just see that there's a home here. Then the Holy Spirit himself will do his we'll work, do work and then transformation is just going to there's happen. There's one story that struck like me, when I, when I went to Singapore, they shared a story about this boy who is a genius, but because of his family background, he hated church and was throwing the part of a, of a hate list and all that. So he then, but he loved to play chess. So because of their hearts for people, they, they, they built a chess team. People were saying, oh, this, this is my cousin, he's very brilliant. The world, it's not like the world must not catch this guy, kind of thing. So they said, okay, I'll learn how to play chess. There are people that even learned how to play chess just for the guy. So they started inviting him to play chess. So they had a multiple service, and this person would, there would be um, people that have attended the previous service, but there would be a room where they play chess. Now, the church is in the same building, but they never invited him to church. So, so they just invited him to play chess. And, and after months, he just... And even the guy with the camera guy that, that was the camera guy first before he saw God's law. Yeah. I'll say that. One thing we also have to buy is agenda. Mm. Um, um, most of us want to make God secular and sacred. No, God is in chess. God is in cameras. God is in technology. God is in shoes. God is in fashion. Mm. And I love what she said is that if we don't attract them, the world will attract them. And it's the truth because they are young people. Their minds are still trying to explore. Uh, I remember as a child, and I would say this as a young, as a young child, you know, in, my teen in my teenage years, S.O.D., Speed mm. of David were the ones who just was SOD and rooftop MCs. Mm, that, that because I was a like I was a white clef Eminem, white clef. I was a Kissy boy. I, I was going that that too. And I saw rooftop MCs. I mean, I, I mean it. And I saw, and that that is why we're working with mm. Red Man and all those people. Just, yeah. but there's there's more. There's chess. There is fashion. There's there's technology. There's AI. We just need to be. There. It's it's a mind stretch. I'm on. I'm just excited to be here and. To see it's possible because yeah. they're showing video. They're not telling us <laughs> no story <laughs> data. They're showing us data page. <laughs> but, uh, they're showing us video. That guy, that, that pastor is forty years old. That guy yeah. is twenty-two. That's uh, the, hey, that's the guy. On the road, I would say, "Come on, move here." <laughs> so it's it, it's amazing. I, I, I'm I'm fully, fully, fully inspired. And, and knowing that you can, someone can come into what they already have. Because sometimes when you know that you're coming in needed, I feel like that's one of the reasons why people, young people are not as involved in this part of the world yet because they don't feel needed. needed. Yeah. So it's like I come to church and I just sit, you know, and all that. I always tell them in church that you're more likely to get blessed in the service that you contributed to. You know, it's that contributing mindset yeah. of being part of something. So now if you tell someone that I don't have to go, you know, um, fa do foundational class for 21 weeks before I hold the camera, mm -hmm. you know, that I already need you even upon arrival. Powerful. And I can, I, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I can trust that God will yeah. do the work yeah. in you even while you're holding that camera. It's, it's, See, it's, 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 honestly, it will take a lot of mind shift because I remember that there's a video she, she, um, she post, he posted about the superheroes, mm. how the older ones like Tom Cruise. Yeah. And, and the younger ones like, like the, the recruits. The recruit guy. And how he was vulnerable. I've watched the recruiter. The guy was just awkward. Like, it, like, it was, it was, <laughs> like it, it kind of <laughs> pissed me off. Yes. At some point, I'm like, what kind of, <laughs> yeah, what's just, going on? Like he, like he was, but, I've, but I think that that is the kind of leadership we have to embrace. Mm. Vulnerable, show your awkwardness, show you can laugh, show your humor. Mm. On Instagram, don't always show that you, you spoke to Elijah <laughs> every day. Yes, yeah, speak to Elijah and speak to Moses and speak to, but they also speak, come there, speak, yeah, to speak to us. <laughs> and dress like us. Dress like us. Right. We're, we're the palazzos yes. and you're know, like us, you understand? Because Christ 
Earth with Zacchaeus. Mm. Most people don't, most people can't even do it. So sure. someone said that some, some pastors and Christ, if they walk in, Christ might be the one who is the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> because we're, we're mature. <laughs> we're, 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 we're mature Christians. And, but that's the truth. We, we also have to learn how to understand the seasons and make sure that we align. Because you know what? Like you said, it's the heart. If you really want people, you have to do what it takes to get people. So yeah, amazing, <laughs> amazing, lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I think we're up for questions now. Yeah. Yeah. Are we? Are we? Time of second. Oh, I think we should have time. Okay. Can still okay. Just... okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question. Mm. So, let, let me ask you guys from my head. What is the aside culture in you know, Because I want to. I'm just thinking. At a 14 years old boy, give your idea to my father. He slaps me. <laughs> I'm just being real. Don't you shut up. <laughs> or I remember when I asked my dad when I was young, guys, I said, Daddy, why do you pay tight? He said, Can a Copeland pay tight? Can a Higgin pay tight? Pay tight. Pay tight. Pay tight. Pay tight. Pay tight. And I'm like, Okay, I'll pay tight. I'll pay tight. <laughs> I'll pay tight. So the cultural part, do you think we can change it? What, what do you think? What do you think? I, mm, let me speak from my experience. Yeah. Um, my mom was also very, very involved in church. She was a deacon, a um, deaconess from when I was small. But now, when you open them to this information, if you are hearing it from people like Pastor Fodger and people that are actually showing results, there's this open-mindedness okay. that they have. So result is, is the key. Exactly. Yes. So okay. I think our parents can actually be very open-minded. They just need to hear it from, you know, like you said, if they are hearing it from you, you're like, what do you know? I spent 40 years in this life. But if the leaders, the actual religious leaders and the influential people in Nigeria are being open-minded to this concept, then I think our parents eventually would come along. I, like, I want to add to what she said, which is result. But as a young person too, I don't think you should be so eager to be heard. Okay. I think you should also understand that the result speaks. Yeah. Okay. If an adult sees that your your result is showing in something, they want to listen. Yes. Except okay. the person is not teachable. But teachable people want to see how you've handled the little that you have. Yeah, so I think that sometimes our generation just want to be heard. But it's like you have a sphere, a small place yeah. that they've given you in charge. Even if they say, oh, just design the church flyer, mm -hmm. do it with so much diligence, there'll be so much results from it, and then they'll, you begin to expand in influence and, and people. So, so as you round up, because it's time, yeah. our, the, these kids want relationship. Mm -hmm. They want, but they don't want discipleship. That, and, disip and discipleship is a, an important kind of ship. It's discipline in it. is the word. Yeah, and, 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 and I know that Instagram has many of us equal pastors. We now have followers. <laughs> we now have you understand, but but there's a place for because I saw that I saw that there. Yeah. There's discipleship. He put, they put people under a mentor. There's a process. So I've noticed how they end their progress with referring, referring to what to what yeah. they have done. They have done. So in so their lives. so it's so key that we don't. Um, and that's what I I must say about the youth. Mm. I understand there's a there's a there's a rebellion in us because we don't want to be discipled. Mm. Mm. Discipleship will bring character yes. mm. and the salt in the taste God in you. So yeah. that's a part. And, and you know what I've, I noticed there? I won't lie. If I'm in step church, I won't need to go to the world. Yes. Do you think that <laughs> I'm saying yes. I'm that I will be a full-time I, I don't need to church. Church. They, they want to walk. See the concert bars. And see the music, say, music bars. I wanted to say, discipleship we talked about also has to do with results. If I see that you're having results, yeah. then yeah. I want to be your disciple. Yeah, I want yeah. yeah. To, yeah. you're right. So, yeah, you're right. So, it's so, it's, so, it's, so, it's so key. It's, it's really key, guys, um, to... I think this is something that will not change in a day. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Will not change in a day. Of course. Yeah. So if, I saw that moving in your term. I was just saying, you know what I'm like, they won't change the you know, go walk. You know, yeah. Even people, of course, coming, it doesn't like everybody accept it at once, but yeah. Yeah. gradually. Yeah. So <laughs> then, the Holy Spirit will do the work. Young pastor, <laughs> take charge. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, right now, we're going to be heading to the interim for the question and answer session. Please go and share the link. You know, let everybody be a part of this amazing thing that the Lord is doing. And if you are in Lagos, it's not too late to join us. Yes. Also, send in your questions um, to the to the YouTube, and it can be picked from there. And so we can ask um, Pastor How and Leah. Have a lovely, lovely service, Thank everyone. You so Thank, Thank you so you much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Dr. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
All right, I'm going to first of all invite up um, 
Christian to come and explain how those in the house, you have a QR code to get the free ebook, and those online, you have another QR code so that there won't be. It's the same book. We are not. We are not. We are in church. We are not. We are not playing games. All right. In fact, there are more options for the people online to buy the fiscal copy. All right. So he will explain. And um, so, so Pastor Han Basile, they have written a book, and uh, all the teachings and many more are all in the book. And for all of you online, uh, there's a link in the on, on online, a QR code you can scan, and it will bring you to a special page that we have created for Pastor Poju's uh, conference, and it will get you a good price. And also, we made sure that we can ship into all the African nations because we understand that many of you are streaming in. But for everybody in this room, everybody who is present in this room, uh, we know you made an effort to come here. You flew here. You drove here. Some of you many hours. And that's a lot of effort. And because of that, Pastor Howe and Pastor Leah would like to match your effort. And we're going to give to all of you the ebook free of charge because... You have paid with your effort to come here, and there's a QR code on the screen, and we can also flash the QR code after the session, so it's for you to download. So yes, enjoy, read the book, and uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm done. All right, uh, for the question and answer. Okay, the QR code. All right, so for the question and answer, there will be four stands. Where are the microphone stands, please, ushers? Oh, oh they're not stands. They're people. Uh, so you have to be far apart. Here? Where are the people here? Yes, thank you. Thank All right. You. Okay. You should have put stands so that they, the people will know where to come to. Thank you. Get four stands so they know where to come to. All right. Four microphone stands so they know where to come to. Okay. So I will invite Pastor Leah, Pastor Howe, and Pastor Garrett. All right. Please. All questions must be based on what was shared here. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you have doctrinal battles in Nigeria, it's not their business. <laughs> it's what was shared in this conference that they are answering. And if you ask any question that is not based on that, I'm on ground here as a local to intercept your question. All right. <laughs> Okay, so let's start. Who, who will go first? Oh, thank you. Who is going first? You are shy. All right, the, the gent, the lady, you can get up. Ask a the question there. My question is, these things that have been brought up... Wait, 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 introduce yourself. My name is Uche Wajuku. I work in all tactical departments. Yeah. I want to know, these things that have been trained in the church, are they also allowed to work in the church and as well do circular job in the society, like accountants, bankers, or... Any other job in the organization? Thank you. You got it? I'll go first? Yeah. yeah. Um, great question. Yes, of course, there is freedom. Um, so we have some youths who grow up and they become full time in church. 
Um, a lot of them, um, they are volunteers, so they have a full-time job as accountant and business people and uh, engineers, um, and, and they still serve in church. And uh, that is wonderful because they can learn the skills, the expertise of the world, um, and then they can help the church progress. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. But first of all, Pastor Pojo, I just want to thank you. Everybody, this again is an example of empowering. I am so impressed and uh, have full respect. Him giving up his time, giving up the mic in his own conference. <laughs> Most pastors will say, now is my time to speak. But Pastor Poju again, is almost like Jesus saying, let me decrease and let um, the guest ministry increase and let them have more airtime. I have never had this experience before. Thank you. All right. I, I, I have a question I want to ask. Um, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I, I know churches in Singapore. Um, so I know that this um, what's the word now? This vision that you have for the youth, this um, drive here. How did you come into this um, understanding and passion for youth? What, what, what really? Because that's not the template for a successful ministry. So, and, and it's a very courageous decision to go in that direction because, I mean, youths are less financially, so, aha. So what did you see that made you say, look, we're going in this direction? The Lord spoke to my wife <laughs> and I obeyed. You can add on, but it is true, it is true, because this is, we laugh, but, but God spoke to me to be a pastor, to plant a church. God, God spoke to her about generations, and as we talked about earlier, um, her vision to me seems to be bigger, greater than my vision. And, and I saw the hand of the Lord upon what she's doing. And, as she, and, and God gave her good success and, and breakthroughs. And I came behind her to structure, uh, to put in systems and organize it for that. And together, together. So, so we are known for being a generation's church and we are known for being a strong church. The strong church part is what God gave to me, the blueprint, that not just any church, but a strong church. But how do you build a strong church? Through generations. So, I'm so grateful. Please don't leave me. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, I think for us, like what Pastor Hao said, we, it's, it's really a marriage that was really uh, enlivening for both of us, the vision that we had. And I think that if left on our own, I would still have served God. If we haven't come together, he would have also served God. But because God brought us together, that's why it became a lot more powerful. Uh, my heart for youth and generations and his whole mindset about strong church. And I always tell him that um, if he didn't come behind and give the structure and the systems and all of it, we would just be a very passionate hippie church. People like, like so, so thank God, God put us together. Answering your question, Pastor Bojung, youth, uh, I have always loved youth from young. Uh, I come alive around them, so you could say that maybe it's a gift, it's a grace. Uh, I love them. I love kids. I love youth. But then again, that's just passion. But over the course of our ministry, so see, 
are they worth it? <laughs> Do we really want to keep on doing this? Because you think to yourself that maybe if you raise youth in your, in your, in your house, you, you bless them, you grow them, that they would somehow stay loyal, sincere. But generations when we've been so hurt, so broken. And that's when I make a decision and say, yes, I'm called to the young people and I'm going to keep raising generations. And that's the moment when the passion becomes a conviction. A passion that is tested becomes a conviction. So I can only tell you that I do run on emotions, but it's a lot more in conviction and yeah, the calling. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right, I, I, I'll take a question online because uh, it's real calling. Now, let me put the con question in context now. Um, so from the onset, it looked like you caught in early on youth, all right, from at least fairly from the onset of your ministry, you, you caught into the dream. But there are churches where uh, people have gotten old. There are churches where people have grown old, all right, okay, and there's a pastor now who now says he's getting a vision for the youth. So, for example, the congregation members will be looking at their pastor, that are you about to overthrow us here? So somebody is asking, those who are above 45, now, but the, but the context is that, in this context, it's not like they have active youth. So what they want to do now is to have a paradigm shift. And in that paradigm shift, right, the people who are 45 and above will feel threatened, okay? And um, so how do you manage that? I'll get started. And Pastor Garrett, you can chime in from the younger generation. Uh, that is such a good question. I'm so glad that I have the time and the opportunity to bring to balance what I've just talked about. Of course, when you invite Pastor Lear and Pastor Hao, we are always going to champion you and tell you about young people. But there is a balance. So first of all, um, this is our third year in this conference. So for those of you who have not um, heard the sessions from us on 2021, 2022, they are all online all right, in Covenant Nations uh, YouTube. And, and it brings into balance because one of the message, oh yeah, I, I think I asked our team to put it up. One of the message you need to listen to to bring to balance is this one, the power of a three-generation church. Because I, I speak about how it's not just about the young, but it's also about the middle age. It's also about the older senior citizens. And they come together and when three generations are strong and empowered, your church will be phenomenal. So, coming back, um, so we, we have, as the senior pastor, we have to teach, we have to encourage, we have to in persuade the whole church, including the older people, to support the young people. In every way, you have to mobilize them. So we do have about almost a thousand older people in our church, 45 and above. Um, so a lot of them are parents, a lot of them are grandparents. And for parents and grandparents, the greatest joy is to see their kids and their grandkids on fire for Jesus. So I got to be honest with you, they say the music is too loud. They sit at the back so that they're not close to the subwoofers. They, they say, I have cataract. It's too dark. You know, and the lights are always flashing. Some of them call us HOGC, Heart of God Club. But, so yes, there are some, not a lot, but there are some who say, this is not for me. And, and we say, God bless you. That's why God has different churches in the city, different expression. If you feel you can grow in another church, God bless you. We are friends. But there are a lot of them, especially when they are, they are, their kids are in church. 
they say, I love it. I love the energy. I love the passion. So they are here. And now, because we need, need the parents to drive the kids to church. We need the parents to cook. You know, the key to a youth revival is pizza. So, so we need the parents to cook and food and have pizza. So, so they open up their homes for the young. So they are all in into this vision. And, and also, finances you were talking about. It is true. A youth church has no money. A, a youth church, the youths, they eat like the locusts in Exodus in the plague. <laughs> when they come, the food is all gone. So they not only don't have a lot of money, they consume. And so when Pastor Lee and I first started, um, we say it like this, we feel like we are parents with 10 kids. It's tough, right, as a parent with 10 kids. But the kids grow up. And the kids grow up to become successful business people like Pastor Garrett, lawyers and doctors. And they understand what it means to be poor. And so now they give. And now they are committed. They say, put put the burden, the financial burden on us. We will carry the burden for our younger brothers and sisters. So yes, initially it was tough, but you go through that and God will bless you. I'm not sure if you want to add. And, and just to add on to that a little bit, um, being in church for more than close to 30 years, <coughs> I see how generations come a full circle because now I'm in my 40, I'm 40 this year, uh, I, my son is at eight years old, and just last weekend, he was playing the drums for the hot kids. Uh, he was serving on the photography team. And so even in, in my 40s right now, I see the need for Heart of God Church to reach young people because in the end, my own children is benefiting and they can grow up in the same revival that I grew up in. So as a parent, when you're older, you see that, hey, we need to invest in the young people because my children need to encounter God in the same way as well. And also speaking from a younger person perspective, you know, Pastor Hal talked about the older people, they help cook, they help drive the kids. You know, I speak to many of the young people and they say, we need the older people in the church. You know, they are not proud, arrogant and say, oh, we can do this by ourselves. But no, they say that we need... We need help. We know we got no money. We know we got no houses. So they'll go to the older people, uncle, auntie, can you open up your house so that we can connect groups in your house? Yeah. So the younger people appreciate the older generation as well. Yeah. All right. Be before I go back to the congregation, I want to ask, do you have a children's church? Sorry? Do you, do you have a children's church? No. Yes, we do. We do. What's the age? You, at what age do they come to the adult church? <laughs> Well, Maybe well. six months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of what's going on. <laughs> my, my kids grew up in children's church. So uh, we have children's church. Um, um, in fact, what's interesting was that Pastor Lear, when the church first started, Pastor Lear was the first children's church teacher, the first children's pastor. And so that's why she saw uh, that there were nine kids that were a little bit too old, misfits in children's church because they were 11, 12 years old, and she saw us and she says, hey, we need to do something for them. If not, we will lose them. So that's why she formed the first teen cell or youth cell group, and that's where the youth grew. You know, it, the nine grew to the thousands that you see today. So honestly, from the beginning, Pastor has a great heart for children and youth. And until today, we still have a children's church. Of course, it meets the needs of the second generation of my children, uh, Pastor Christian's children and all of them, but we also are intentional in our children's church to reach first generation Christians because we know we, just, we don't just want to have second generation Christians, but we want to reach first generation Christians with our children's church as well. All right, but the okay, but point I'm trying to make is I saw 10 year olds, 11 year olds in your services. So at, at what point did they come into the main church? The 10 year old, 11 year old, they are in the main church. Uh -huh. They are. So they are, when they are playing the drums, when they are on uh -huh. photography, they are in the main church. So they are integrated. Mm. Now, yes, we have a children's church for the four-year-old, uh -huh. the seven-year-old. That's where I'm going. We, 
and then we let them serve in the children's church and then they come to serve in the main church. So if, when you come, you will see kids running the main church. The church is run by kids. Okay, last question. I, I follow up on this. So when you invited, I mean you invite people, um, Pastor John Bever, Bishop Bloomer, the 11-year-olds listen to them? Yes. And they yes. understand them? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, <laughs> All right. Question from that side, please. Yo, please. Yeah, the guy in the blue shirt. Praise God. Yeah. My name is my name is Nelson. I'm from the Leading Edge Christian Center. My question is: With youth, there is usually um, the hunger for opportunities. You know, youth always want better opportunities. How are you able to manage influx of people? People you have invested in discipled and they want to take an opportunity in another country or another city away from your church. How, do, how, how does that, do you feel hurt by that? How does that work? All right, so yeah, what he's saying is that if you train youths uh, keen on exploit, uh, well, exploiting opportunities that come their way. So after you have trained them, they can become so valuable that their talents are needed in bigger cities or in, big, or in other nations, and that they leave, and that uh, you get hurt by that. You get what? Hurt. Heartbreak, yeah. Yeah. So how do you, what's the question? Manage that. Huh? So the fear is, if I invest in these people, they will become valuable and attractive, like what he said, that the company wanted to hire him. Mm. Yes. So I think what he's suggesting is that so how do you in this part of the world, they, they may take the... Other people want that. <laughs> yeah. uh, if it's a foreign company, they will be gone. I, I think you, when you... Jesus says count the cost. When you invest in the lives of the young people, you must be prepared you must have the right expectation that we sow into the young people, but not everyone is going to be grateful or be loyal. Um, and some might even backslide in the world. They learn the skills and they become successful in the world. And they forget about God, they forget about church. Uh, we have that. Um, but that must not stop you from doing what is right, doing what Jesus does. Jesus knows there's going to be a Judas. Jesus knows that nine out of ten lepers are not going to come back. But he still healed the one leper. He still loves them. He still, he does it. So, so we, we say it like this, when you give, don't remember. But when you receive, don't forget. So you need to have the right expectation. So I want to burst the bubble that we all have. Listen, if you want a church of 120 youth, you will have 10 Judas. Ouch. Jesus says the parable, you sow a seed into four kinds of ground, four kinds of heart. Out of four kinds of ground, how many are good ground? Only one. So out of four youths, if you have one, that's a win. That's Jesus' statistics. So honestly, for every one, Pastor Garrett, we probably lost three who are no longer here. So you just have to keep doing it and you do a lot. Yeah. You minister to hundreds and you disciple thousands of you. And then you will have the remnants. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. And I just want to share from my perspective as well because there were those that left, like what Pastor and Pastor mentioned. Uh, but what made me say uh, was really because I had a vision that God gave me a vision for the church, a vision to be a pastor, 
Um, and that really kept me. Because you, you, in the Bible, when Jesus called the disciples, He said, follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. He didn't say, follow me and I'll love you. Follow me and I'll comfort you. Follow me and I will be there for you when you're sad. You know, but Jesus says, no. He gave the disciples a vision. Follow me and I'll make you fishes of men. So what happened for me, you know, I'm going to share my story a little bit tomorrow in the youth rally. Um, but it reached a point where I had an opportunity to go overseas to study. And my parents really wanted me to leave the country four years overseas away from Heart of God Church. But I knew that that would mean that I would be away for four years. I will miss out on the opportunity to build the church, to grow in church, and I will compromise my destiny in God. But I just, so I made the decision. It, it, despite my parents being very disappointed with me, I said, no, I'm going to stay in Heart of God Church. I'm going to stay in Singapore. I'm going to give up a more prestigious education overseas because I'm called to build the house of God. Please, and, all right, the gentleman in blue. All right, come. Why are you people coughing? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. So, so Pastor Howe, when you find the Judas, ah. do you allow them to infect the rest, or do you amputate them? Yeah, so how do you That seemed to be the question that everybody is thinking about. A lot of hurt pastors in this conference. I, I, I don't want to go deep because every case, every person is different. And I can't give you a general rule. Um, your leadership is different. Some of us needs to be stronger in our leadership. Some of us needs to be more loving in our leadership. So it's very hard to answer. In fact, it's even hard to label somebody a Judas. H how do you know this is a Judas or this is a prodigal son who will return? Only God knows the hearts of men and women. And they are so young. But at the same time, don't be foolish. As pastors, don't be naive. So, so Jesus says, you know, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So, so we are not saying that um, we, we allow, you know, the Bible talks about a leaven that leavened the whole lamb and get one person infecting the good culture, the good people in our church. No, no, no. Then we as shepherds, we have to be a leader and make strong, tough decisions. But at the same time, um, we, we extend as much restoration and grace as possible. That, that's, yeah. um, I think for us to feel a person is a Judas, the situation must have reached a very intense point and very <laughs> um, ferocious confrontations. Uh, but I, I think from another perspective in answering that question, um, for me, I like to always evaluate my leadership. And I think we are all pastors and we need to acknowledge that we're not perfect. We are still very much a work in progress in terms of how we lead people. So for me, I have a principle in life is that for every occasion that calls for someone to be called a traitor or a Judas, it's obviously been very painful for us to be able to go to that stage but I like to use pain for my own gain. I would like to use it to evaluate myself. And I always say, did I do anything wrong? Could I have done better to avoid this in the first place? And if I think that I could have done better, then I would change because God has called us to be better leaders. Um, but if I felt like, you know, it's just you, it's your problem, then I would just like, okay, maybe that's you, I'm okay. But I like to evaluate, that's the first E. But the second thing I like to do is to expel 
whatever poison that has been entrenched or toxins in my heart in that, in that, in that situation. Because if you want to grow a healthy church, you have to be a healthy pastor on the inside. Yeah. If your heart is tainted, um, your church is going to be tainted. So evaluate, expel. And the third thing is mostly in those cases when you call, with people are called Judas or make you feel like they're Judas, usually I don't think we can do very much about the person himself. And then in that case, I always go to the third E, which is to entrust the person to God. The Bible says entrust your enemies to God. And so I do that. The three E's are very important for me. It keeps me pure in serving God and it keeps me growing as a leader. We can never, you know, be perfect. So I like to grow. All right, the lady. Um, yeah, no, okay. Praise yeah, no. God. My name is Grace, and I work in the pastoral care unit. Um, my question is um, how do you deal with children and their parents? Like parents that may not want to willingly give up their children, you know, for all of this. There's some parents, some parents that may just say, no, I don't want to give my child to you to train or something. How do you deal with those scenarios? Pastor Jared talked about his parents, right? Not wanting to allow him to travel overseas for the studies. How, you know, how do you navigate that scenario? Um, how? <laughs> Your parents are bad. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, I, I think the way we have led young people, I, I think we are very strong leaders and they are very young. And I, we must be very careful on how we frame things for them or how we get them to make decisions. Uh, they are so easily pliable in the hands of adults. So for me, I like to think that the approach would be, for us, our style of leadership has always been to paint you the consequences if you make this decision and paint you the consequences if you make this decision. That's how it's discipleship is like. We help you to see consequences and you have to make your own decision. And in a scenario like this, what we would do is possibly get Pastor Garrett to say, right, so this is, this is where the tension is with where your parents' counsel is. The situation is that if you go this and this is gonna happen, but if you stay, this is gonna happen, you know, you have to balance the whole thing. Consequences, consequences, and you will have to see which one you want, and the choice is yours. We don't make choices for them. They will have to make their own choice. Does that explain it? Yeah. Does that explain it? Yeah, yeah and, and, and I think that um, everyone has an individual calling. Um, it's not dependent on your parents. You know, Pastor Howe is a great phrase. He says that God has no grandchildren and um, that every child has a unique call that God has for his or her life. And, and as a parent, first and foremost, we must understand that, that we are just stewards of our children's life and that our goal is to make them successful in whatever God has called them to do. And of course, if we can convince the parents to see that, that would be beautiful. But if not, the parents should, I, I personally feel, should not, com, should, not be a com, should not compromise a child's calling in God. You know, and if the child feels like, I want to be on fire, and it reaches a point where they have to make their own decisions, their own convictions. And of course, like what Pastor Leah said, we will guide the children on how to have the wisdom to, lead, to guide them to relate to their parents with still honor and respect, but still living out their godly convictions. All right, I want to ask you, Pastor Garrett, um, how do your parents feel about what you are doing now? I would love to say that, um, okay, my, my, parent, my family is a whole long story by itself. Uh, I come from a broken family. My, my, parents was, uh, my parents were divorced when I was a young kid. Um, my mom was a single mom. Um, she was a Christian. She, was, she, she is a Christian. Um, she wanted me to go to church, but one day at 16, I told her, Mom, I want to be a pastor. And she got upset. You know, she says, you know, I've raised you up to have a successful career. Why are you throwing it all away to be a pastor? So she was really upset with me that I wanted to be a pastor, even though she was a Christian. And uh, so I, you know, that's why when I, she wanted to send me overseas, I believe one of the reasons was so that I would not be so 
distracted by church and God. Uh, yeah, but the truth is, until now, she's, she's a Christian, but she has never said that she's proud of me. She has never asked me about what I do in church. Um, but, you know, I, I've grown, I reached a point in my life where I learned that I'm not living for the, I mean, I love my parents, I love my mom, I respect her, but I don't live for her affirmation, but I live for God's affirmation. I'm not living according to her standards, but I'm living according to God's standards. Uh, just uh, to wrap this up real quickly, and we can move on, is the, uh, we, that's individual, but as a church, as an organization, we try our best to partner with the parents. So every year, once a year, we have Academic Excellence Weekend. In Asian culture, studies and, and doing well in school is very important. Um, and so we have academic, academic excellence where they can say, oh, my kids come to church and their grades, their results are better. And then it's an open house because people are suspicious of what they do not know. People fear the unknown. And a lot of parents, they have never come to church before, um, but the kids have been coming. So when we have an open house and they come and they see, oh, the pastors are not monsters. <laughs> they are hanging out with good young people yeah. and a lot of them are, are more open to their kids spending time in church. And, and just one thing to add, with that, you know, we reached a lot of parents uh, who are not Christians. So their kids come to church. So a lot, we have a lot of parents in our church and they're in our church because the kids brought them to church. Yeah. So uh, it's upside down in our church. It's not the parents bringing the kids, but the kids bringing the parents. So every time we have the academic excellence weekend, it's a great time to win the parents and many of them stay in church, give their lives to Jesus. That's a powerful idea. Madam, I will call you. You can come. You come, 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 come. Yeah. Yeah, you can come. So after this, I need a Gen Z question. Let's practice what we have been preaching. Are, are you Gen Z? You don't, you're not Gen Z now. Look, look at your hand. <laughs> you're not Gen Z. Uh, ask. Okay, thank you very much, Pastor Koju and Pastor Hal. Pastor Lia, thank you very much. So my question is this, that you actually seem, that's to Pastor Hal and Pastor Lia, you seem to know a lot about details of people that is their personal lives. How are you able to keep up with the constant updates without burning out? Because you actually also make yourself available and even like you travel over to attend maybe their graduations. How do you still, how do you manage all of this without burning out? How do we and can I have some more questions, please? Oh. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have one more question. When you, it's still about the children, when you are trying to engraft them into service, how do you deal with maturity in their decision-making process? Because children can be quite young and I feel like they might not know exactly what they want. How exactly do you help them in their decision-making process? Thank you very much, sir. I, I think the question, the second question we can answer real quick, I've shared it. It's about inviting, including, involving them. And in that journey and process, you disciple them. And when you disciple them, they get mature. Not everyone, but a lot of them will grow in maturity. So that's the second question. The first question... Um, that's why we have five SPs, so that we all don't burn out. You know, I think one thing that I really admire about Pastor Han and Pastor Lea is that I've seen them from day one just loving the young people and I've seen them, their hearts being broken, disappointed, but they still do it. And I want to encourage some of you here is that the young people that you lead are seeing you. And I was just growing up, I was just so amazed by the hearts of Pastor Han and Pastor Lea and I'm so inspired that I wanted to be like them. That, to, that despite heartbreaks, despite challenges, to still keep loving people, keep loving young people. They were my role models. They, are, they, they set the example for my life. And uh, like what Pastor Leah shared earlier on, the three E's, it's more than just a teaching, but I've seen her live that out. 
And, and honestly, one thing that really helped me growing up was pasta and pasta were very real to us. They didn't hide the problems away from us. They, they, shared, their, their, they shared the problems in the church. They shared um, the disappointments, their heartbreaks. And with that, we learned to catch their hearts. We learned what to do when th- th- you face disappointments in life. You learn that ministry is not just a bed of roses. And it grew me and discipled me to be a leader I am today. Amen. All right. Uh, just uh, so our friends from Ghana who came all the way from Ghana. Do you have any question? I'll, I'll open. G- Ghana, are you Ghanaian? <laughs> are, are you are you're from Ghana? All right. So where is the Ghanaian crew? Okay, that's right. Okay then. Uh, okay. One question because we are opening the book. <laughs> it's like you have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Koju and the team. Okay, so my name is Asel Benedict Koju. I'm from Ghana. And <laughs> from Rohi Church. And I'm a youth pastor. I want to find something from um, Pastor Liam, Pastor Howe. From the presentation, Pastor Liam made us to when you have youth, you also have the package of the mess up that comes with their blessings. I want to find out that cultural diversity is something that goes along with grooming and training as one of the factors you must consider. And we are trying to learn from the Asians, which are different cultural dynamics. I would just want to find out for them, what are some of the methods they use to groom the youth, that's the first one, to adjust them to the new church culture and how to factor cultural diversity in this grooming and training for the youth drive. Thank you. Culture is a very interesting uh, concept. Culture, it can be a ethnic culture, a culture of a country. It can be a culture of a church. Um, It can be a, and of the best, is biblical culture. It doesn't matter whether you are Western, you are white, you are Asian, you are African. Yes, they're all different. Uh, but you, culture is engineered. It doesn't happen naturally. So we see ourselves as cultural engineers. We shape the culture. But you shape the culture not just with the microphone and on the platform, but it's individual. You see, individually, we don't have a culture, but individually, we have convictions. And so if you can get every single youth to have the same biblical convictions, when the youths come together, the convictions become the culture. So a culture can be bad. A culture can be unbiblical. Or the opposite, a culture can be good, can be biblical. And we have to shape them. When we first started, we have maybe 50 young people. And 48 of them has very bad culture. Maybe two or three has the culture that we want. So we begin to work on the two and then get the two to influence one more and then one more and then one more. After a few months, maybe 10 and 40. And then you work on them individually, individually all the time. The Lord gave me a verse when I was very discouraged with the culture of our church, of our young people. We call them the nine stones. Not a compliment. It is out of frustration. 
And the Lord gave me one verse. It says, talking about King David and Saul, it says that the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker, and the house of David grew stronger and stronger. And that's culture. So when I look at the young people, I see the house of David grow stronger and stronger. Every week as I preach, every week, every day as I disciple, disciple, disciple. And now from 10, we have 20. Then we have 30. And soon the good culture will overpower the bad culture. And then some of them in the bad culture are unhappy. And then they leave, which is even better. <laughs> because then your good culture gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But... It takes time. It takes years. But when you have a good culture, then it builds momentum. It's a spiral up. So culture is very important. Very good question. All right. There's a person right at the back. You've been putting up your hand. That, yeah, that person there. You tried. I thought the person was doing a selfie since for almost five minutes. Yeah, no, 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 no. Behind that pillar. Yeah, in black. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> can you can you can you come out of the pillar so we can see your face? So my name is Joe. Are you a Gen Z? That's all. No. Are you a Gen Z? Gen ha! Come out! Come! That's I, I knew the way you put up your hand. I knew that. That this was a young person. Huh? All right, you can ask. Okay. My name is Joel. Um, I have to ask questions. Yeah, Alpha, you can ask two questions. <laughs> Right. You are saying there are some things in the adult church that children shouldn't hear. Is that what you're saying? Children that the pastor is saying that the children cannot understand. Okay. All right. All right. So your question is, how do you get recognized, first one, in the ch church? So, how do you get recognized? in church as a young person yes first of all i want to clap for you for being so brave to stand up among so many pastors and ask a question you are a champion already the bible says in uh, timothy let the youth be an example in purity, in your faith, in all that you do, how do you get recognized? Um, it is not abilities, it is not performances, it is your maturity, it is your character, it is your faithfulness. That's good. Thank you. So when you are, you know, in, in, in our church, we, we have this term called MIA. Is it familiar for you? Missing in action. So we say, don't go MIA. If you are always present, not just in the services, but you are serving, you are cleaning the church, 
you are faithfully building the church, um, people will see you. People will recognize who is this kid. So let your character shine. So it is not just being on stage. It is not just abilities. It is your character. And God, don't worry if you are just in the toilet, cleaning it, you are in the back room serving. God took David from the backyards of the, of the desert, tending sheep, and said, He is my chosen one. And in the same way, God will cause people to recognize you when you have a heart. Well, you know, have you, you have seen what I talked about Pastor Garrett and the other two senior pastors, Pastor Charleston and Pastor Lynette? The, you see them at this point in their lives, but when they first started out, uh, Pastor Charleston, he stood out because he was, we, we, you know, we used to do cleaning of the church and we lead the young people to clean the church, hands on, really cleaning, toilet bowl, everything. And Pastor Charleston always cleans the cleanest toilet bowl and nobody could beat him <laughs> when he was cleaning the toilet. Always the cleanest. So that tells me that that has something to do with where he's now at his level of life. He was very faithful to do whatever he was given. The Bible says whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. You're going to wash toilet bowl, be the best at it. You're going to serve food, be the best at it. And the key is this, when you're doing all of this, your heart must be so pure that you're doing it to love God and to love people. I have never quite seen people who go around looking for promotion getting it. But if you would be faithful, promotion would chase you. You don't have to chase it. And Pastor Garrett here, when he was a little boy, he was just doing the trans... Okay, now you have projector and all of it, but in our dinosaur days, he used to just... Transparency, printed sheets on a projector. You know, it was very hot mission. You, you flash lyrics when people were doing leading and stuff like that. He was excellent at it. He overqualified for his job. You have to work to the place where you're overqualified at with the level you are now. That's how you get promoted. Is that okay? Yes, That's how you get recognized. Yeah. But be bold like you are today and you will be recognized too. Bo as a lion. Woo. Thank you. Pastor, can I take a bit of time to share something oh, yeah. that I feel is in my no, heart? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I was in the green room talking to Pastor Fab and Pastor Godwin, and uh, we were talking about a nation, and, um, and we talked about how you can change a nation, especially... In, in the policies, in, in the way it is being run. And, and I'm not a politician um, and certainly don't intend to be one, but I believe that uh, we can change a nation by changing the hearts and the, the, the character of young people. Because the young people, they will grow up to be your future lawyers and business people and even statesmen and, and politicians. They will be the people who will run the businesses, the hospitals. They, they are the people. We know that. Um, but if we can put character, integrity, love for others, people, love for the country inside of them at a young age, in 20 years, they will be the people making the policies. So for me, when we say youth revival, yes, we want great youth revival. The youth are touched by the power of God. But I see the potential for social change. And it's in the young people. You see, it's hard to change a 40-year-old a 50-year-old, they are quite set in their, in their ways. But if you can influence a 14, 15-year-old and you have that relationship with them for the rest of your life, one day when they are 40 
and they are business leaders and they are policy makers. And we could be in our 60s, but they will still come to us for advice, for mentoring. And, and we can be able to share about the Bible values to them. And they can make policies that will shape our country. So for me, I see not just youth revival. I see that if I change a youth today, I can change my nation in 20 years. And, and I want to conclude with this. Universities. Wherever you are, whatever city, there's a university. Focus on university revival. If you look at history, church history, almost every major revival is birthed from university. Pastor Poju, there are many university fellowships are where they are ignited, captivated, and they build powerful ministries out of university. But even in secular social justice movement, if you look into the history of the American civil rights movement, all the movement, it is always powered by university students who are idealistic, who caught a vision, and they want to make the world a better place. Right now, every future prime minister, president, every future policy maker, movers and shaker, you know where they are? In university. So you may not be able to influence the current policy makers, but if you can have the opportunity to influence them now. So I feel so strongly in my heart that every church should focus on university students and if your location is close to a university, you should just reach out to the university, disciple them because you will make a great difference in your nation in 20, 30 years' time. Thank you. Very good. I think that's the best way to close. That is a rounding up statement. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, you can feel the Lord said we should round up with that overview. Let's put our hands together for Pastor How Pastor Lea. We said we are rounding up. You are putting up your hand. Rounding up. I think we can... We've come to an end. So, so let's put our hands together as we allow it. So we are back here tomorrow. If your question wasn't answered, the next question and answer will be on Thursday. All right. So pray that your question, they will call you. Huh? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, and sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest upon us now forevermore. Amen. It was almost like saying I cover myself with the blood. The way some people were looking at me that I put up my hand, it didn't call me. <laughs>
first edition. It was an amazing time in God's presence, I guarantee you. If you missed it, please rewind and watch it again. You will need to watch it over and over again. So, as it has come to an end, we would like to interview some of, our, some of the guests that came for the program. And our first guest today is Tolu Wanimi. Tolu Wanimi. Please introduce yourself. Please introduce what yourself. church do you attend? What How old are you? First of all, like the audience, what's your name? What's your name? My name is Tolu Wanimi Enoch Akinola. I attend God's Heritage Christian Center. I heard about this church from my dad who wanted to go very early, but I insisted on coming with him because I wanted to hear some preachers speak about the Word of God. Very okay. interesting. Tolu Wanimi, how old are you? I'm 11 years old. He's 11. That means he's a generation so. alpha. Yeah. And this, this program is already working. It's yeah. already working slightly. So, um, I would really like to ask, like, did you have any reason to come? Like, did you, like, want something? Like, did, did they force you to come? Like, did your dad say, okay, Tolu Anini, let's start moving? Or you wanted to come? Like, genuinely wanted to come? Yes. You wanted to come? Like I said before, I wanted to hear the word of God. I wanted to understand some few things that this church might actually bring to my heart, oh. bring to my knowledge and understanding. Yeah, okay. So I'm guessing since you understood this was a pastor's conference and you insisted on coming, do you have plans or maybe do you have yeah, plans like, to become a pastor, a minister in future? Yes, I actually have planned about it before. My dad too is a pastor. He passed Okay, oh, I see. Apple okay. doesn't fall from far fall from. That's very, very interesting to look at me. And I like that I like the fact that you're very very good orator and then you are very bold. Thank you very Thank much. You, so what stood out to you in today's session? What exact did you learn anything? I'm guessing you did learn yes, something. Learned, what stood out to you? Like from Pastor How and Pastor Leah, mainly what they were talking about is about generation about this generation. Yeah. He said something that really stood to my heart. That the new generation is not replacing the old generation. True. Guys, but true. They, are, but they are they are in they're reinforcing. The, they are yeah. reinforcing for yeah. the old generation. Yes. Old generation. Okay. Now say something about the deep bed. It means that the new generation is actually coming to continue Speak what to me. already built on the already existing yes, foundation. Sir. Now means that the new generation must continue what the old generation has already started. Yes. Okay. What they continue. So, in your church, do you work in any department? Yes. Do, you, do you like serve? Yes. My dad actually takes me to the church most times. Mm -hmm. Since I'm no more staying in children's church, to work on the keyboard. Keyboard. So, you can play the keyboard. So play wow. The keyboard. Yes. Um, is there any other department well. that you want to work in but you're not able to work in yet? in actually right now but they they put me most times but another person will now come in and start okay. doing the work for me most times. Oh, so like they are training adult, you? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Another word. Okay. That's that's very that's nice. Very, very nice. Thank okay, you very so we have me. other guests in the house today. Tolwanimi, it was an amazing time with you and yeah. I believe the audience were blessed with you. So please let's have our Thank other you very much. Um it was actually very nice. Having that was a very, one. that was a very. In so, basically, you that's can why I said don't push your children out. away. Yes, bring, bring them, your children bring with them, you. Them bring like, them to the church. So, Allow them watch with you. Okay, so, so now uh, we have new guests so with us. People, yeah. Sorry. Hi. Both of you look beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon. See, Good afternoon. Because afternoon. The, the too much knowledge that made me start. Good afternoon. So, what's your name? Please can you introduce yourselves? And my name is Eniola. Eniola. Oh. What church do you both what attend? Church? Do you, you both attend, attend the same church? Same church. Okay, what church is that? Okay, I'm oh. get, from the way you look, you look like you're youths, right? Yeah. But you're and both you're in youth. school? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. 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 So, so that's, that's like nice. you, you came all the way from Ibadan. Ibadan. Yeah. Yes. Wow. For pastor's conference. Okay. Can you see how serious pastor's this is? They came all the way from Ibadan to Lagos. They came from Ibadan. And you are in Lagos and you don't want to come for pastors' conference. I'm trying conference. to tell you guys that if you are in Lagos and you are not here, you are on your bed. If you are in Lagos and you are not here, you are Please. wrong. Thank you very much for coming for pastors' conference. So what actually stood out for you? Like, what did you, like, what, what made you, like, really, like, what How did you hear about the conference? What motivated yeah. you to attend the conference? So actually, I heard about the conference from our senior pastor. Oh. Okay. Oh, very, very nice. Well, we're more than, we're six. Wow. Oh. Two more are coming tomorrow. 
Oh, that's amazing. He's a powerful So was your pastor right? Did anything stand out yes. to you? Oh. He did. A lot of my questions were answered yes. There are a lot of questions about how to, you know, move on to the next generation. Mm. It was really answered in today's So I just have a very, very you know, inquisitive question. From your look, you look like um you'd like to be a pastor. Do you like plan on being a pastor or a minister currently a pastor wow thank you you see Let's the, celebrate the, the spirit the spirit is already always <laughs> directing me that's not what i'm talking about so how do you plan on building the bridge in your own church yeah I plan on building the bridge by utilizing the things that i've learned here yeah. and really being intentional about outreach to um, school yeah. okay. because that's where the young ones most are young people are true and um, my question is Yeah. With their children. With their children, and yes. Them. So it's been a wonderful conference and I'm sure I'm going to get blessed tomorrow. Mm. What stood out to you I'm on the other hand? Belong, belong first. Yes. 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 Yes, like people yeah. that just externally be Christians yes. and That's inside they are not. Oh, yes. That was very amazing. Like I asked before, but I guess you didn't hear my question. Yeah, I said, what was your like key point? Like what stood out for you? What's like, the what one sentence you? that? Well, he think you know when something would, hits you, you can't like, be like that one is you know like well, there was words that hit my head and then all that. Oh my, like, so I just like really want to know. What was your what, major moment? What was like your point there? Major point that stood out to me when the video was playing about Henry, remember Henry's video? Yes, yes, Henry's video. The he spoke about the fact that if the world can go to the extent of having so much excellence mm. in what they are doing, then why can't the church yes. also push it? So he now started bringing in new innovations because it was an IT. So that stood out to me a lot. Like yeah. We should always aim for excellence, for improvement, and updates. We can't be outdated. Yes, we yes, we can't. We are the pioneers. Very interesting. Actually. Thank you so much Very for much. honoring our invitation. And you God thank bless you. Thank you very much. And so, um, trust that personally, you, you, have you that are asking, you that you're yes, asking somebody, you that are asking somebody, what was your take home? You Watching this conference home. alone, I was looking at my life and I said, God. I said, I, I God. Mm. I said, I said God. God. This is a, oh, a, a six-year-old handing a camera yeah, and I'm like, here in church. Really I'm great. thinking oh, I'm making impact. We have another guest in our midst today. Sorry, please introduce yourself. Yeah, I think it's a blessing. Blessing. Sorry, what church do you attend? TNTC and Yaba. Yaba. Okay, so we are like a coming on initial member, but from another center. Are you a pastor, a leader? Leader. Um, not exactly. I'm a, I'm a leader of the community group in that house. Okay. okay. So, what was your major standout for today? So, I think um, for me, the the whole program was very mind blowing and actually very enriching. And I think the most important thing for me really. The, the conversations around generations. So I think it's very, very important, especially even away from church building, if you're going to build anything that is going to be sustainable, yeah. you're going to build a legacy, right? I think the concept of understanding generations and investing in them, I think it's something that's very powerful. So for me, that's like my major takeaway. Oh. I think the second thing is also the, the first mindset is saying that um, it's a leaders today, not tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Yeah. Yes, yes. Like we get our yeah. tell us we are leaders of tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. I think 
this time. But tomorrow actually be begins today, so every exactly. day makes it uh, that's that's actually very very understandable and very interesting actually. I like the fact that the fact that I said leaders are actually that of today and not only tomorrow. Because so how do you tomorrow think, again, we'll how do you, think you can step into this generation and be a leader, be the shift? So I, I mean, a lot of things on my mind. First of all, I need to go back and listen again and really digest because it's important to convert this not just from knowledge, but yeah. you know, steps. So for me, I think I'll be more involved in you know, lead team activity. I mean, if there are younger people yeah. starting others, we've seen people leading from 12, yeah. raising the next generation. So for me, I think I'm going to go back, think, and see how. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's, that's amazing. really nice. It's nice that you actually are, in, are planning to implement it because there, there are a lot of people here, personally, that would hear, like, there are Christians that believe, like Pastor Howe was saying, that we have to rearrange the traditional systems. Yes. So there are Christians that will actually just put it externally and want to, like, just believe, do what they ask them to do. But the fact that you're actually planning to, like, implement it is really interesting. And thank you for that. We hope thank to see more of you. Thank you, Blessed. Pastors thank you so Conference. We appreciate your presence. Yes. Thank you. You can. Thank you very much. So, so um, we trust you were blessed by today's message. Yes, and blessed. if you had, and if you did not, if you were not able to watch today's message, yeah. maybe network issues. Or That's anything, too nice. Please, it's on YouTube. It just takes data. Yeah. Rewind it. Rewind it as many times as it tomorrow. takes for you to digest it. I don't even want you to hook up online. Come here. Come here, yes. If you're in Lagos. If you're in Lagos. Come. People come came come. all the way from Ibado. And you are in Lagos. Please you are in Lagos. Please, this here. is the place to be tomorrow, Thursday. Please be here. We have yes. a seat reserved for you. Yes, yes you at the back yes. of the camera. You. We have a seat reserved for you. Please, we trust you are blessed by today's service. Thank you God very much. bless you. Thank you very much.